Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to Therapist Theater. My name is Josh Treese, and I'm coming to you from Music City USA with the podcast that takes a look at relationships and mental health through the lens of movies, TV, and pop culture. One of the things that I love the most about Nashville is that it's such a therapist-rich city, by which I mean that there's a ton of therapists here. Not that the therapists here are rich, mainly because, like, I'm not, but that means that for the most part, I can throw a rock from my balcony and hit an amazing guest for this show. Of course, if I did that, they wouldn't want to be a guest because they were just hit by a rock. But having so many people who practice all around is great. Every now and then, I get the chance to have someone incredible on who doesn't live nearby. And far be it from me to allow distance to prevent me from learning from someone. Because of that, Today's episode was recorded remotely, so you might notice a difference in its sound quality. This week's guest is coming to us from the Hoosier State. Andy Gregoric is a therapist in Indiana and one of the first people that I met when I went to grad school. Andy is one of the smartest and most resilient therapists I know, and she brings with her a perspective on the 2005 Tim Burton movie Corpse Bride that I can't wait for you to hear. So... Let's get to it. Dim the lights, raise the curtain, and start the previews. Welcome to the theater. Um, Andy. Yes. Welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. It. I'm trying to think, I think the last time I saw you was at graduation? It was, yes. Yeah, it would have been graduation, which is, it does not feel like it is like a year and a half away. It's, it has been a year almost since graduation, which did you finish in December of 17? I did, yeah. Okay, which means it's been almost a year and a half since we finished up school. Yes. Yeah. It, it, and it's, it's crazy to think that I, uh, do not feel like it's kind of a weird thing being a year and some change out of it because I, I like feel a hundred times more competent than I was when I graduated. But also I feel like, why are people allowing me to do this? Like, <laughs> I'm totally Hopefully it's, it's in here. more of like a uh, Christmas morning way. Like, yes. oh, wow, how do I get to do this rather than like, ooh, they don't ooh. know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's it's definitely more more the more the former than the latter. But it does it does feel odd at times to just like, wow, I'm here doing this thing that I set out to do because I we started in what fall of 20, 2015. 15. Yeah. yeah. Long, long time coming. Yeah. And it I I definitely had when we started this like message in me where I wasn't sure that I could do it. Like I wasn't sure that I could make it through. Right. So making it through, I, I now have this thing in me where I think, Oh no, I don't have any excuses. Now I know that I can do anything. <laughs> right. Because that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life was grad school. Yeah, I look back and so when like I was doing my internship because I was at a like a group home for boys and I had to be there 24 hours a week and then I was working full like between 25 and 40 hours a week and then also like working side jobs and I just I don't and then still going to class and doing homework. I don't know. I don't know what I did. Wow. I don't know how I did it. A lot of coffee. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, the the year that we started our clinical internships. I was still doing class full time. I yep. had the clinical internship and I was working a part time job and Leanne and I were planning our wedding. Yes. And that year was crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I just kind of looked imagine. at it. I, yeah. I, I had this boss uh, a long time ago who, when when he was at his previous place of employment, they sold Christmas trees during the Christmas time. And uh, 
I guess that due to the nature of Christmas tree selling, you have to have somebody there 24 hours a day on site. Um, Christmas Weird. tree theft is running rampant. And so okay. Okay. Whenever, <laughs> whenever we came to a place in our job where we knew, all right, we're going to have to work extra hard for a short amount of time, he would always call it Christmas tree season or Christmas tree lot season. Gotcha. And he would just say, all right, we're coming up on Christmas tree lot season. We got to put in extra hours. We got to put in extra work, but it's temporal. Like it's only going to last for a certain amount of time. Right. And somehow that always made it seem like it went down easier. So I think that like all of 17, when I was doing those four things, I was yeah. just, I just had to go, all right, it's Christmas tree lot season. This is going to yeah. be a certain thing and then it's going to be done and that'll be great. Yeah. Um, well, I like to ask every guest that uh, joins me on the show, why therapy? Like, why did you get in? Why did you get into what we're into? Yeah, well, so that's, I talked about this a lot. Like, th this is something that I pretty much have this, this kind of key story. I didn't, I didn't wander into therapy by accident. And actually I had, um, so the, there's two kind of things that I've been considering it for a long time. The impetus for me to actually apply to grad school were that two very dear family friends of mine. I was actually at a, at a wedding actually, um, which is, you know, a very thematic and relevant to the movie today anyways. But I was at a wedding and these two older friends that are lifelong friends of my parents, family friends, um, Bert and Charles and Bert is like the nicest guy ever. And he's so sweet and like mild mannered. And this, this guy of all the people grabbed me by the shoulders and like shook me a little bit and told me you have to apply to grad school now. Like you can't, you're, he literally said, you're young, you're unencumbered. If you don't go back now, you never will. And so I actually went home the following weekend and applied. So that's like. Did he know you were interested in he, any particular thing or did he, he just did. think. I I was talking to him about, so he's a psychology professor and I was talking to him. So I, I taught for three years before I became a therapist. I taught middle school and I taught high school. And I'd kind of talked to him about not really being happy with teaching I liked what I did. I just, I never woke up and like was thrilled to do it. Um, and I, I cared about my kids and who they were as people way more than I cared about the content. And I had English teacher friends that were like, Oh, I love this book. It just, you know, I'm so attached to it and I have all these brilliant ideas and I'm going to trainings and that just wasn't me. And so, um, from the time I started student teaching, my last day of student teaching, actually, my supervisor looked at me and he said, Andy, did you mean to be a therapist because you're talking about student teaching and it sounds like you maybe meant to be a therapist. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that is what I meant to do. I actually not <laughs> mention it. That's exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but I decided to stick with it for a couple of years. Cause a, I just, you know, had just finished a four year degree and decided it was worth a shot. Yeah. But also like, you know, you don't really know how much you're going to like things. I didn't know how I was going to feel about it until I was in my own classroom and then I thought, well, I don't really like middle school. Maybe I'll like high school. And I liked it. But um, in the course of that, I uh, had students coming to my room with um, suicidal plans. I had students coming to my room with like, really significant hardships. I will never forget one day I was sitting in my room and this kid like stuck his head in my door and was like, what are you doing? And he had you know, like go to class and he just kind of, something seemed off. So I grabbed him from out of the hallway and was like, what's going on? What's happening? And this kid had, you know, been physically abused that morning because he got in between like a parent and a younger sibling and oh, was, gosh. you know, bleeding pretty, not like badly enough that he needed stitches, but you know, I like clean, you had a first aid kit and first aid trained, you know, clean him up and stuff. And it was just like, you know, I had a lot of those types of situations and I would talk to my other teacher friends and they did not have kids, you know, coming to their room, asking for band-aids and talking about their family hardships and not nearly to the extent that I did. Um, the right after I stopped teaching to continue on in grad school, one of my students passed away from suicide. Um, never really got over that dealt with probably four or five suicidal high, high school students while I was working there. And I just, like, you know, I'm really tired of not being able to do something about this. I don't think these kids would continue to end up in my room if I wasn't called to do something else. And I had the same thing happen with parents. You know, I'd talk to parents and I would just find out all these things about these kids' home lives that nobody else was aware of because, I don't know, people just talked to me. And so I kind of took that as a sign from the universe that I needed to uh, to be doing something else. And so 
I had this same conversation with Bert and uh, he grabbed me by the shoulders and shook me and I applied to grad school and got in and the rest is history. Um, and now that I've been, so I'm, I'm in private practice in a, in a huge group private practice, um, just absolutely massive group private practice. But now that I'm here, I've routinely said that my worst day of therapy is still better than my best day of teaching was. So yeah, that's how so, I, I mean, I know that <laughs> were you, you weren't teaching while you were in school. Oh yes, I was. Yeah. My, the first, yeah, the first year and a half of grad school, I, so the first semester I was in grad school, I went to night school. Like I went only at night, uh, and was teaching full time. And then I spent an entire school year teaching full time and going to grad school full time. I can't say I recommend it. Yeah. Wow. Are you still teaching at all? No. Nope. <laughs> nope. Okay. I um okay. I occasionally like I'll do some freelance editing. I actually do through work. Um I I do actually that's not true. I do still teach. I do um all of the suicide prevention classes for middle school and high school for the um school district that I work in. Um, so they're middle school and they're high school. Um, well, I have, there's another teacher who helps me out with the middle school cause I can't be in two places at once, but I do all of that stuff. And then I do some like professional development. I've spoken at Purdue. Um, wow. so I still get the teaching in there and just, just you know, no grading papers and no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no state testing. So there you go. Yeah. Nice. Um, so, I mean, I think what I'm hearing you say is that it, it was something, I'm going to choose these words. It was something that seemed like it flowed out of you because you were noticing what does it seem like I enjoyed doing and what does it seem like people come to me and ask me to do? Yes. Yeah. That's a lot prettier than it was. Uh, I think it was a lot of the universe kind of like hitting me in the face repeatedly and just yeah. I ended up doing a lot of walking around like, why do these things keep happening to me? Clearly it's a uh-huh. sign from a higher power. <laughs> it's just a coincidence. So Yeah. I always think about that scene at the beginning of Bruce Almighty where he's like driving and asking, you know, God, just give me a sign. And then like a big truck steers in front of him with a bunch of stop signs like on the back of it. It's carrying those. And there's like a, a road sign that says like, don't go any further. And there's all these signs that are all around and he's just not, not, up on not it having it. No, no. Yeah. But, but kind of, this is kind of the reverse though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I knew that, I knew that I had to try. I was like, you know, my, my teaching license actually just ex- expired last year. So I knew I could always go back to teaching you know, and I could go do, but you know, once I got into grad school, like the, the further I went, the more things just started to click, the more opportunities I had open up for me. And you know, the more I really, really loved it. Um, I stuck it out through like a, a group home for adjudicated boys. So I figured if I could do that and not hate it every day, then I was probably going to be okay. Um, not Wait, to, I have to ask you a question. Yes. What does adjudicated mean? Uh, so these are young boys that have been pulled out of the home. So uh, these are boys. They well, they're. I don't. I'm a, I haven't been there. That was my internship all 2017. Um, but they, yeah. So they have been pulled out of the home because they were, you know, essentially what we'll, we call juvenile delinquents. Um, but multiple arrests, a lot of these kids had felonies, had been expo- expelled from multiple schools. So There's basically nowhere else for them to go. Um, so, you know, young men with drug addiction issues, young men with just a lot of, a lot of really, you know, a lot of family problems, a lot of, a lot of trauma. Um, and, you know, they also just didn't, they were not willing participants. It was compulsory therapy. They, they didn't want to be there. Gotcha. Um, so it was mandated. Yeah, it was mandated therapy. And so I figured, you know, and I've always loved, I, I just love angry teenage boys. That's one of my favorite populations to work with. It's definitely not the bulk of my caseload, but it is what I, I do enjoy them. Um, and I kind of, you know, about halfway through, it's like, you know, if I can if I enjoy this and this is kind of, you know, one of the most difficult populations to work with, like, man, like this is clearly what I'm supposed to do. And we had fun. We had, a, wow. we had a huge vegetable garden. We ended up with those group, that group of boys that ended up growing like 40 pounds of vegetables Holy cow. in an eight foot by eight foot plot. <laughs> so 
<laughs> we have, what uh what do you think it is about that particular population that you like so much um it's what I did when I was teaching so I taught primarily like inclusion and special education students so I uh like I've just had angry like angry teenage boys since like pretty much eight, one angry middle school boy since day one of my like career um I just I they don't scare me I don't back down from them and I I've just always been very successful with it I, I think it's just a personality thing um, I, I tell my clients often, like, I'm not the person you come to if you need like a lot of warm fuzzies. Um, I don't, you know, that's just not who I am as a person. I'm very much a straight shooter. And so I think that tends to, to work pretty well by the backside of it. I'm like teenage girls. I just kind of have a hard time with, you know, it's not like I'm completely ineffective, but that population, I really have to like, think about what I'm doing. Um, so I think it's just a personality thing. I, I'm going to push back on you there a little bit, though, because I, while I'm sure that you're speaking in broad terms and you're being a little kind of stereotypical, I, I don't think that you're uh, totally anti-warm and fuzzy. Because, I mean, I think, at least in my experience being your friend, I think you're very supportive. I think you're very empathetic. I think you're an absolute great hang and a great uh, conversation. And so, I mean, I I don't want you to, like... I don't. I don't think you're. You know. Don't want me to sell myself. Just through. a drill. <laughs> yeah, you're not a drill instructor. No, I mean, no. I, you know, it's not that kind of thing. Right. But I could understand how, you know, especially if you're working with a lot of young men who, um, are mandated to be with you. I could understand needing to be more directive. Yeah. Than what you might be with other people. Yeah. Well. But I. I would, I would think and hope that that's that's coming from a place of you know I care about you and. Um, I just, I said this to uh, a client earlier today, you know, your line of thinking got you into this. And so your line of thinking is not going to get you out. Right. You know, so you're going to, there's going to be an element of uh, humility and, Mm -hmm. and choosing to submit to a system other than what you have normally relied on. Right. Well, and that's, yeah, that's very sweet of you. You're not wrong. I'm not, I'm not anti-warm and fuzzy. I think the thing with the, with the teenage boys is that I, I don't tend to, a lot of them have gotten where they are because they can run people off. Um, you know, they can like Mm -hmm. be big and tough and scary and yell and say really heinous things. And because I've worked in public schools, like, you know, I've been called every name in the book and I just, I don't run away from things. Um, and so, you know, there are very few behaviors that, that scare me. Whereas like, you know, I've had chairs thrown at me and stuff like that. And it's, it's not, uh, you know, so therapeutically I'm like, listen, there's, you know, there's like, okay, yes, you're a big tough guy. Let's, let's, you know, move on now. Um, and I, I do like my teenage girls. I think I just, I have to be, I know for me, I have to be a little, think a little harder about what I'm doing. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't flow quite as easily, but, but it's also what I've done. I mean, Presently, uh, the bulk of my population, I don't really specialize necessarily. The bulk of my adult population is pretty much couples and adults, adult women in particular with PTSD. Um, that I did not mean for that to become my specialty, but my uh, clinical director oh. kind of saw pretty quickly that I was g- really good with that population. And so I've come to enjoy it a lot. Um, and I know I, I said repeatedly in grad school, I was never going to be that therapist. And I have, I've eaten my word. I've, I've, I've become that therapist and really liked it. Um, I, yeah. I do, uh, I actually do a lot of, um, early childhood development now. I like with kids as young as three. Really? Therapy. Mm-hmm. I really enjoy it. I do a lot of play therapy and a lot of kind of developmental stuff and parental coaching. And then, you know, I'm sure you have the same thing. You've always got, you know, anxiety and depression and adjustment you know, all those kinds of things. You've always got a couple of those people in the mix. And, um, I don't really work with addiction or, um, uh, severe mental illness is the other thing I don't do a whole lot of, but I still have a couple, couple of those people on my caseload, but that's, that's kind of what I do now. Um, the place I work has a ton of school-based therapists, so I don't have as many of those. Um, as many like kids, especially during the actual school year, but that's kind of, kind of what I do now. Wow. I do a little bit of everything. Um, how much do you think, 
I feel like this is a silly question because the answer is obvious, but I'd just love to hear you talk about it a little bit more. How much do you think being a teacher shaped who you are as a, as a therapist? You know, that's, I was talking to somebody about that recently and, um, I, I was talking with a colleague and I was talking with a client and they both kind of brought the same thing up the same day. They were like, you seem very educational in your approach to therapy, um, which I didn't realize is true. And, you know, one of my clients is like, it's not, she, she said, it's not that you really tell me what to do as much as it is that you just like, you know, kind of like teach, just use the word teach, just teach me that there are different options and then leave it up to me to pick a door, um, which I thought was really interesting because I don't think about it. But yes, like I, I do take things in a very educational approach and not so much in like a psychoeducation, like here's tons of information about your brain. Um, you know, with, with parenting and stuff, I am a little bit more educational just in terms of equipping people with information. But I think my therapeutic approach is just generally like, Hey, you know, here's what I'm observing. What do you think about this here? You know, what are some doors you can take? Um, and much more like, exploratory. I don't do a, I don't know if this is making sense. I don't stick to like a workbook approach. Um, that's not how I, how I tend to work. You know, it's, it's much more like, Hey, let's get you educated on, you know, your own patterns, your own systems, and then have you develop, um, you know, kind of your own treatment plan, your own solutions for that stuff and what's going to work for you. Um, I've never been a big fan. That sounds very uh, strength space yes. almost. Yeah. I do a lot of postmodern. I do a lot of, a lot of solution focused, a lot of narrative. Um, I do a combination of trauma focused CBT narrative and guided imagery. That's pretty much my go-to for trauma work of any kind. Um, but yeah, very strength based, very, very client centered. Um, because I just, I don't, I, I, Work, I know some therapists really like the workbooks and I definitely am not like opposed to using them, especially for like, you know, I have a DBT workbook that I really like, especially for, you know, personality disorders and stuff. But generally speaking, um, I just can't, I can't fault like, you know, here's your diagnosis. Here's how we treat it. One, two, three, four, the end. Not that I think there are a lot of people like that out there, but I particularly yeah. reject that. So. Yeah. Um, what about like, how do you think, how do you think being a teacher shaped your person of the therapist? So like, I mean, it's pretty clear how it shaped how you do the practice, right. but how did it shape, you know, who you are as a therapist? Um, you know, the thing about, I think maybe one of the most important things is like when you're teaching, you have this, like you have things planned out. Um, and you have in your head, like how you're going to do things. And, and, you know, this is my lesson for the day and this is what we're going to accomplish. And it like never goes that way ever. <clears throat> um, <laughs> like you have something planned that you think the kids are going to hate and they end up loving it. Or you have like this really great killer lesson plan that you think is going to be so engaging and it just doesn't work. Um, which I kind of, uh, learned very quickly to like give up on expectations. I mean, I still have a framework there for what I do. You know, that's like, you know, my therapeutic frameworks and my solution focus, like I still kind of have the the structure of kind of how things go, but I'm tend to be very like, you know, I've, I've never really struggled with like, you know, what clients bring in or, or anything else. I find it very easy to kind of flow with people because that's what I had to do when I was in the classroom. Um, you can't, you cannot teach and be a rigid person because, you know, some days class is going to go great. And some days you're going to have a kid show up and like, you know, I had a kid show up and like literally just walked into class and started beating up another student one day. And you have to be able to adapt to that. And it's the same way, you know, sometimes like I've had clients come in and I think I'm treating them for anxiety. And then one day they come in randomly. I'm sure you've had the same thing happen, but they drop this, you know, massive piece of trauma that you're like, well, you know, now this completely changes what I'm going to do. Um, and I think there's yeah. definitely a learning curve for some people where, you know, that's something they've got to learn to flow with. I've, I've never really struggled with it because I think I've had to adapt so often to what I'm doing in the classroom. I really have, you know, when you're teaching, you have to be able to kind of intuit where your kids are at and, and adjust pretty quickly in the moment, um, which is, a, you know, a good bulk of, of the therapeutic process. Um, I also... Yeah, dropping that, dropping that late bomb 
I I had to realize that that happened like during my internship. I want to say at least two times, maybe longer. But I had to realize that that is, and this is I think assuming positive intent. But that is them waiting until they feel like they can trust me enough to tell me. Right. Totally agree. With um, you there. Which, I mean, I know that, like, you know, there's a, a Saturday Night Live skit that was out a couple of weeks ago, probably more than a couple of weeks, but it was this year, where it's a guy on the phone with his parents, and, like, right before the parents hang up, the dad's like, all right, all right, love you, son. Uh, mom's going in for surgery to amputate her leg. Yeah, Bye. I saw that. And, like, they'll drop this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll drop this giantly major thing, like, right at the end. And that's kind of a joke between – um Leanne and I, because there have been times where like both of our sets of parents have done that. Um, and I think sometimes with clients, they want to do that because they feel guilt and shame around, you know, whatever it is that they want to get out there, but they don't really want to address it. So they think, oh, if I drop it, at oh, the for end, sure, then it's off my chest, but we can't really talk about it. But they don't really ever think about there's a next right. week. Um, so I think that you've got, you know, the, the positive side of, I just need to know that I can trust you with this. And then right. like maybe the, the negative side of, I just need to dis- this. Right. Chest. Well, and you know, sometimes I think too, it takes people being in therapy for a little while to realize that what happened to them was a trauma. And also, yes. you know, I think it's, even as a therapist, I think it's sometimes it's hard not to judge people. Cause you know, people, people come in, walk into your office and present one way and, and, you know, you end up kind of completely changing their mind. I think, you know, it's the same thing. My, my class, my class clowns and like kids that were difficult and just kids that, you know, when I was teaching just really like didn't have anybody in their corner. And, you know, it's not like there'd be, you know, a lot of it was behavioral, you know, these kids who just did not know how to behave. And the more you find out about their home life, the more you're like, wow, this really makes sense. Like, Mm -hmm. I think it's, it, you know, has made therapy easier and more difficult in some ways, you know, um, but I think it's, you know, for me, at least in, in my, you know, continued growth, it's important for me to, you know, kind of take on new clients and, and you know, try work really hard not to assume things about people because you just don't know what what people are going to bring in until they bring it in. I've, yeah, and I think I think one thing that I've really intentionally chosen to do to kind of go along with that is like I have my clients fill out an intake form. I don't read the intake form before the first session. Right. Mainly because during my clinical internship, I found that when I did that, I was always listening for the one thing. Yeah. And so if they weren't saying the one, and and when I say the one thing, I mean, whatever it is that I picked out to listen for from the intake form. Right. So like I would narrow it down to what I thought, oh, well, this is the major problem. And then I'm sitting there during the first session just kind of listening for that one major problem to come up. And if it didn't come up, it's like my my listening is only at 80% because I'm waiting for that one thing to peak my listening to 100% right. when I can jump in. And so what I found was, you know, they're going to fill out the intake form. I'm not going to read it till after the first session. So that when they come in, I can be totally present. I can be totally with them, and I can I can check my expectations at the door right. and let them present themselves as what they want, and let them ask for help with whatever they want to ask for help with. Right. So we we have our you know we have kind of a I, I do a similar thing. We have a massive. Um, so I work for a company um, in uh, northern Indiana. I actually live about forty five minutes away from where I work. Um, we have, a, so our intake process, which I do mostly intakes for my own clients. Sometimes we transfer, but not often. Um, and we do a really intense like biopsychosocial. So we're going through medical history. We're going through, you know, um, educational history and just, just all the histories. And, you know, ultimately we do bill for insurance. So, you know, ultimately we are looking for a diagnosis, but more often than not, the ha- I mean, not that we don't want to, you know, miss something, but also, you know, to some extent there is the whole thing with insurance and, you know, you can't, you have to have certain codes to be able to bill if, if you want to spill your insurance, which is, it, it just, that is what it is. But, um, I don't ever skip on those, you know, I, ha- I don't ever skip on those questions, you know? Um, cause you never know where you're going to de- like define things like in the family history and the social history, you know, asking people like, 
you know, how much, how much college have you completed or, you know, how much school I ask how much, how, what's their, you know, most completed mm-hmm. school. But, you know, sometimes in those questions, which you would not necessarily think are really important, you, you learn a lot about a person's story. You know, sometimes it's like, well, you know, especially with older clients, like I only got my GED and I, you know, dropped out because I got pregnant at, you know, 15 or whatever. That's a really important piece of their story that I probably wouldn't have gotten otherwise. So, and maybe it's not an important piece of their story, but I find it. I think it is. You know, I think you, I, mean, you, that, I get a lot more information is my point than I probably would have if I just didn't, you know, didn't go through that whole process very thoroughly. Yeah. There's a method to the madness. In theory, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it feels it, In I think that's like the the thing about you know I think a lot of people forget that therapists are people too and so sometimes clients are sitting in there like so scared and I'm I, and I'm sure I really you know it's our goal to project mm-hmm. like I'm totally fine but internally I'm like why are you so scared now I'm scared what are we gonna do yeah so I was gonna say I think a lot of therapists forget that therapists are people too very sometimes. true yeah 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 and that, that's part of what, what I found is like the beauty of doing this show is, I mean, just as I chat with people, A, I end up finding that I've got a lot more in common with people than, than I imagined. Oh, for sure. Um, but B, you know, I've had people call me out on stuff and I've, I've called other people out on stuff and, and not like calling them out, I guess that's, but you know how sometimes when we talk about ourselves, we, I don't know, talk talk bad about ourselves or, or, or talk in a way that is um, on the surface level self-depreciating. Mm-hmm. But you know, when you get past the surface a little, it's a little self-shaming. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I just think that this has allowed me to realize on an even deeper level, you know, hey, I am a person doing this and I'm never going to be 100% perfect at it. But I can strive to be 100% present right. and I can strive to be um, compassionate and empathetic and uh, I can strive to be more knowledgeable because in certain cases that's going to help. But, you know, they, they would tell us in school all the time, the number one tool of the therapist is the therapeutic relationship. Absolutely. And so that's, that's really all we need is the ability to be present. Right. Well, and some of the best moments I've had clinically are moments where, you know, I've talked to clients about things and it's like, listen, you know, I'm not sitting on someplace above you where I've figured this out and you haven't, um, you know, these are things I struggle with too. Um, you know, and, and being able to just let clients know, you know, I'm, and I'm fine. You know, I I don't tell every client this, but I'm certainly fine with people knowing it. You know, I'm six years recovered from PTSD myself. And so seven years this year, actually. Um, so, you know, with some of my trauma clients, it's, it's been a really powerful thing to be able to say, you know, Hey, I've been here. Um, I know, you know, I've not sharing my trauma obviously, but you know, say, Hey, I'm, I've recovered from this too. And I can tell you for sure that it does go away. And so that's been a lot more powerful than saying, you know, well, based on this study and this treatment protocol, 75% of people have blah, 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 blah. Cause nobody really cares, but you know. I have good moments with clients about or it's all not that, stuff. Cats and gardening. Yeah, it's not that it's not that people don't care, but it's just it's that powerful. like knowledge mm-hmm. knowledge doesn't actually help right. people. Like or I should say by them gaining knowledge about, you know, whatever particular issue, um, that's not going to help to get rid of the right. issue. If it's even something that can be uh, can be stricken right. from the record, which a lot of times, you know, things aren't like, like with addiction, which is what most of my practice centers around. Once you're an addict, you're always right. an addict. Um, and so it's not a matter of, I'm going to tell you a book to read and you're going to understand addiction better and you're not going to struggle with it anymore. Um, I think I may give you a book to read and hopefully by understanding or learning some things in it, it's going to help you understand yourself more and it's going to help you get in touch with your true self more. So like in the end, it's not going to matter what, you know, Dr. So-and-so says about addiction, but rather does this tool help you to get more in touch with your own heart 
and your longings and desires than, than not. Right. Well, and I think, you know, there are, it's, there are definitely some things clinically, you know, a part of, part of being a good therapist and, you know, part of the relationship is being able to tell clients, you know, look, this is something that's not going to go away for you. Whereas, you know, some things like anxiety and depression, I tell people all the time are just feelings. Um, it's only at a clinical point when it impairs with your functioning, but you know, th those are things that you're going to have come and go at different points in your life. You know, PTSD in particular, and for those clients, you know, is it ever necessarily going to go away? Is that trauma ever going to go away? No, but can we get to a, them to a point where they're, you know, really not, uh, not symptomatic at all for months and months and in months and, you know, sometimes years at a time. Absolutely. Um, so that almost sounds like, remission. yes, yeah, it, it is. And, and I've, I've had really, you know, I've been practicing a short time with the, with the PTSD clients, with the trauma clients, especially the women that I've had, not because I don't, you know, the men don't have the same success rate. I just don't have as many of them. Like I've had a pretty significant pool of female clients where I can, you know, pretty confidently say this, um, at least in my experience, but you know, they, most of them have gotten to a point where they're not having flashbacks, you know, more than once a month or they're, you know, they, they can get their nightmares to go away completely, or, you know, it's only happening once or twice a month. And, you know, as time goes on, you know, as the months pass, those things get less and less and less frequent to a point where it's almost not noticeable. And so, you know, that, that's a really, really good thing for people who are having, you know, some clients are having flashbacks, like, you know, 10, 20, 30 times a day. Um, so, you know, for those people, like once a month is like, it's not there. Um, and getting those things yeah. cut down from, you know, an hours long thing to a minutes long thing is really significant. So just depends. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you know, you mentioned your own recovery from, from PTSD. Mm -hmm. with, with some of your work centering on people with trauma, um, is it ever difficult for you to sit with those people? Like, does it ever trigger you? And um, do you do anything specific in your own self-care to help you uh, be able to practice uh, in those situations. You know, I really, that's what part of the reason I never wanted to be a trauma therapist because I was really worried about my ability to be effective. Um, it's, I, I can, I can't say that it's, it's never come up or I've never been, you know, triggered. I've never had a flashback or, you know, a dissociative episode in session. Certainly. Um, honestly, I, I, in those moments, I'm really, you know, when I know I have those clients coming in, I make an effort to really focus on them because the thing of it is nobody's story is my story. And the same is true for each of my clients. You know, even if we had been through something similar, their story is still not my story. Um, and my story is not their story. And so it's, I think it's, it's easy it's easy for me to separate it out just in, in thinking about it, because like I said, I do, you know, I do a very narrative focused thing. And, and more than anything, I, I kind of have described it to clients like, you know, we're in the trenches together. Like I will come down into the grossest, most horrible thing you've ever been through. And I, I will sit there with you. And it's not, it's not scary to me. You know, I'm not averse to the details because I've, I've heard some really, really horrible things. Um, but the end goal is healing. You know, um, I do in terms of my own self care, I'm very, um, you know, aware of the things that trigger me. I, uh, can't say that I'm never triggered. I was, that happened last month, but it's something that I'm very aware of. Um, and I know that like grounding exercises and deep breathing helps a lot. Um, I do a ton of yoga. I do a ton of yoga. I work out a lot, which I feel like is a very cliche thing to say, uh, for, you know, um, young female millennial, but, uh, <laughs> but it, it works for me. Um, and so I do a lot of yoga and, you know, the other thing too, I've, I've done, I've done so much work around my own trauma that it's not, um, this is yes. definitely not the venue for it, but you know, I've talked mm -hmm. about it so much that it just, it just does not bother me anymore. Um, so. Well, and I think that that's, and, and I would say it, it, that's something important for people to know, you know, the overwhelming majority of the therapists that I know see a therapist and 
in the same way that we would tell our clients, you know, there's nothing wrong with asking for help and seeking help. We believe right. that too. And so one of the reasons why we're able to get down in the trench with people is because we've done our own work. And so it's not, it's, it's not that we're not affected by anything, but it's that we've, we've sought how to understand it and process right. it ourselves. And some of the hardest things I've had to listen to, um, like just really gruesome, terrible things have, you know, they're just, I find myself a little bit affected just because of how awful it is, not because it has anything to do with me. And, um, you know, uh, one of our, one of our professors in grad school, Dr. Leahy, um, who I miss, (laughs) She, um, she told me once, you know, I was staffing this really difficult case that was just like, if you think like a child called it level abuse, um, that I was working with. And she said, you know, it's, it is okay for you to be upset about what has happened to this kiddo. It's okay to feel compassion. It's okay to be sad about it. It's just not okay to hang on to it. Um, and that was like, I think the, one of the biggest therapeutic tools for me and working with the clients that I work with, you know, it's okay. And I've sat in such with clients before, like, I'm so sad to hear that happened to you. That's so, so terrible. But when they leave, I let it go. Um, cause it's somebody else's turn. And ultimately yeah. my goal is for them not to be hanging on to those things. So I can't hang on to it either. That's, I think their goal exactly. as well. So I, um, when I was in my practicum before my clinical internship, I had a day, I think it was week three, where I had six new intakes on top of I already had, this was my week two with my first client. So I had seven sessions, six new intakes. It's literally the second week I had ever done it. And, you know, intake, very first session. So, of course, like, whatever's bringing the person in, it has gotten so bad they're seeking help. And so this is kind of like the, the zenith of the story as far as how bad things right. can get. And so I remember at the end of that day, Leanne and I ended up driving out to Centennial Park and walking around it for like two or three hours. And just, it took me, you know, a couple of hours to feel like myself again. And I began to notice during that practicum that that would happen a lot. Like I would, I would leave my site and I would, I would still have all of these stories with me. And so something that I had to tell myself was, you know, these aren't my stories, so I don't have to carry them. Right. And I had to develop a little, I developed a little ritual where I would always take, because, you know, I would, I would, you know, wear a, um, a button up Oxford shirt or something and a pair of slacks and, you know, nice shoes or whatever when I would go into the office But that's not how I dress in my everyday life. Like I am strictly a t-shirt and jeans and rainbow sandals guy. So like I would take, I would take a changing of clothes with me. And for me, it was a ritual. Like when I completed my last session and I entered in my notes, I would change clothes before I left the site. And for me, it was kind of a symbolic way of saying, all right, I'm shifting roles and I'm going to leave these clients stories here knowing that I'm going to pick them up again the next day, but I'm not going to carry them with me because they don't belong to me. So I can't, I've got to leave them here. I do a lot of compassion meditation around that stuff, but like, it's kind of silly, but on a somewhat, like I turn my, I would do it anyways because of, um, uh, like just saving energy, but I have a closet in my office that like, that's where like, um, all of my clients, like all their stuff gets kept. And so obviously I, that's where all my toys and play therapy stuff is. And so I leave it open, um, like when I have clients and stuff and I always leave the light on. And so in the closet all day. And so when I leave at the end of the day, I turn the last thing, the very last thing I do is turn the closet light off. Um, and in my head, I'm just like putting all of that stuff to sleep. <laughs> like I'll pick, pick it up tomorrow. Yeah. It's going night, night now. Um, and that's, that's yeah. become like a weird little, weird little mental thing. But I think it's, ne- I think it's necessary. Yeah. Like if you're gonna, if you're going to be a therapist and you're going to survive, like you, you can't, you have to have stuff that you do for yourself. I 
do a lot of traveling and stuff on the weekends too, which helps tremendously. I really make an effort to live my own life when I'm not in the office. Yeah. Th thus far, I have not had many weekends. Like, just because of the nature of the, the career that I had before grad school and before right. doing this, carried into up to this point, you know, still working uh, a second job on top of my right. job as a therapist. I haven't had a I haven't had an open weekend since two thousand and two. So it's been a straight seventeen years of having, my <laughs> having your weekends, weekends occupied. occupied. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do with all your free time one day? Oh man. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, actually the I mean this is this is kind of some news. Like, I mean, as of today, I gave I gave my notice to my my other job. So in three weeks. I will have one job and that is to be a therapist. And from going from 2017 when I had four jobs down to one, literally it's been a dream to go yeah. down to one job. It's been an absolute dream. And that dream will become a reality on May the 15th. So close. Yeah. I, yeah, there's no there confetti. should be confetti. You should have a whole confetti cannon. Um, Wait, no, no, I said that wrong. There's going to be fun fetty. There you go. Yes. yes. I'm going to hold you to that. I'm going to look for the, I'm going to look for the internet posts. Listen, cake is my love language. And so it is, it, you know, Leanne asked me a long time ago what my favorite kind of cake was. And I just, just said more. <laughs> That's so funny to me. I used to yeah. cater waiter. And so I've been to 250 weddings. And so I'm actually really averse to cake. Whoa. Um, there's like very few kinds of cake that I actually enjoy, but for the most part, people are like, you want some cake? And I'm like, no, because I spent like four years going home smelling like cake daily, which you would think would be great, but it's not. Yeah, it sounds it's great. That. Yeah, for me, it's the simple stuff. Like it's the, it's the fun fetty cake mix, but here's a lot of people will get this wrong. They'll go straight to fun fetty frosting, but that's a mistake because fun fetty frosting just has sprinkles. Awesome. What you want to do is go to the rainbow chip go. frosting. That's that really makes, where the magic is at. Yeah. And because of that, you got to cross brands. You got to go Pillsbury Funfetti cake mix, Duncan oh, Hines. Oh, go for the, the Duncan Hines. Frosting. There you go. Some good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's down to a science. But I'm good with, you know, cupcakes, bunt cake, any type of shape, whatever. Just, Just all the cake. cake. There is a, okay. so in Nashville, there is a restaurant called City House that makes a, um, they have an in-house pastry chef who makes something called Tennessee Waltz Cake. That is one thing that I lose my mind for. It's like caramel, toffee, espresso, right nonsense. Yeah. Ooh. It's where my favorite bartender in the whole, Tennessee yeah, it's Waltz. my favorite bartender in the whole world works there, so. I actually oh, just wow. made a trip back to Nashville just to, just to go back to that restaurant. <laughs> So I feel like that's it worth is. it. Well, I also, um, we, you know, went down, went back to see some, some friends of mine and stuff. Cause like, you know, things with my partner are getting, are getting kind of serious and that was a nice, well, they're getting really serious. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to be like a whole engaged serious here sooner than later. Um, yes. Ooh. Very exciting. Um, and that's actually, you know, I think it's been really important for me in um, my relationship there and also with my relationship with my family, you know, going back to this whole idea of self-care and really monitoring your boundaries as a therapist. If you, you know, with, if I wasn't doing all the things that I was doing, I think I would have a lot more issues in my personal relationships than I do. And it's hard because people want to know, people want to know like, oh, you know, do you work with crazy people? Do you work with, you know, schizophrenia or this, that diagnosis and what's that like? And, um, you know, a lot of the times I just have to tell people, like, I just don't, I don't want to talk about it. Um, and you don't, you don't really want to hear yeah, about it. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, yeah, and I would, I mean, I would say I don't work with anybody that's crazy. Oh, I mean, crazy to me. No, so I don't work with anyone who's crazy either. But, you know, you, you do, I have gotten that question before, like, what's the, what's the, you know, weirdest situation you've ever been in? Um, or, you know, what's kind of the, the, you know, strangest thing you've experienced, that kind of question. And, and so, you know, I've, I've have to do a lot of destigmatizing my family and, and, you know, everybody I, I have close relationships with is very understanding, but I think, you know, when people I don't know very well find out that I'm a therapist, I tend to get a lot of those questions. Yeah. But that's part of the re that's, I mean, one of the biggest reasons why I wanted mm -hmm. to do the show is because I, I want to make mental health, uh, 
more uh, e- more easily understood right. to people, and I want to make it more accessible. And so for me, it was all a matter of like, okay, cool. So what framework can I use for that? Well, I'm I'm sure I could tell people everybody everybody read this textbook, and then we'll all meet up and talk about it. Or I could do I could you know use something that everybody is already into and just say, cool, right. let's talk movies and let's talk you know how do they show you know these issues that that right. we deal with on a That's day-to-day basis. That's a great basis. segue. Well done. Boom. Boom. Well, I was going to segue out of when you were talking about, you know, getting engaged yeah. yourself. I think, I think either way, either right. path can get us there. But speaking, speaking of, that of stuff, tell me what movie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Tell me what, uh, tell me what movie Bride you brought today. by Tim Burton. Corpse yes. Bride. I got to say that when you initially brought up that movie well first off that no. wasn't your first choice your first choice it's was only Spirited Away, DVD. which i was stoked about yeah i was stoked about because i'd never seen it um i have traditionally i wouldn't say that i've like intentionally shied away from animes but i i just haven't really engaged them that much and so like i was looking forward to seeing it but yeah, you know, yeah. it didn't work out because right, I couldn't right, find it right. on streaming anywhere. So then, when you brought up Corpse Bride, I was way into it because a, I love anything right. stop motion, like period. I love it. B, I love Tim Burton. Um, and so that kind of fits into the wheelhouse. I think, I think the stop motion thing, like I ended up really loving it because when I was a kid, you had all of the yes, the Rankin and Bass. Um, yes, loved them. Um. But really, like, my love for it came alive even more um, whenever um, Studio Leica started producing stuff like yes. Coraline, yes. Paranorman, uh, Kubo and the Two Strings. Um, those movies, for me, like, lit my brain yeah. on fire. Uh, and I just fell Coraline in love Coraline is actually done um, by the director and I think, of Nightmare Before Christmas, who is not Tim Burton, and Henry Selleck. Henry yeah. Selleck, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, Tim Burton, like, I think conceived of those characters, like yes. they were drawings yeah. that he had. Well, he had a whole story, Selleck, and then it got developed into a movie. I could tell you more about Tim Burton than you would yeah. ever want to know, and I still don't know enough. It's a little bit gross, but um, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I've gotten way into it, too. Um, I, I mean, Nightmare Before Christmas, I think, before the, the right. studio Leica stuff. Just because it was so different oh, for sure. when it came out. Um, so here's 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 a, a question that I always want to ask anybody that I'm talking with about Nightmare Before Christmas. Is it a Christmas movie or is it a Why Halloween? Why be restrictive? Movie? So I watch it both at Halloween and Christmas. Um, I, I, I used to keep count of how many times I've seen Nightmare Before Christmas. And it's when I stopped counting, I was somewhere around 384. Um, so I've, I've seen that movie okay. like an obsessive number of times, uh, just because I love it so much. Um, which is actually why I kind of wanted to avoid talking about it here because I've, I feel like I'm, I'm so pigeonholed <laughs> in. The episode yeah. will be about that. I've, I've, uh, I, it's hard yeah. for me to see that think, movie in a new way. So. Yeah. I, uh, I used to live in Southern California and, and when I was there, I had a uh, season pass to Disneyland. And so for me, um, Nightmare Before Christmas gets categorized because of Disneyland. Every year at Halloween, or I should say leading up to Halloween, they would um, close the Haunted Mansion and they would redo the inside to where it it wasn't just the Haunted Mansion, but it was Nightmare Before Christmas on the inside. I'm sad that I missed that. Like all the characters, all of the, I mean, everything was Nightmare Before Christmas and they would have it Christmas, I'm sorry. Uh, Halloween yes. until Christmas, That's they would have it that way. So for me, Nightmare Before Christmas isn't, it's not Halloween, it's not Christmas, it's right. those are the bookends, and it's yeah. everything in the middle, um, and, and it's good yeah. any time in the middle. Well, it's Tim Burton's work, and all. it's it's all been very important to me. Um, my uncle, Tim, who passed away, uh, that was like our big connection. So I have, I'm actually like sitting here with, I have my little like Corpse Bride toys, like just for inspiration, I have those, I have 
all the figurines from Tim Burton's book of poetry. I have all the Nightmare Before Christmas figurines and books. And I have like a three foot tall Jack Skellington that says things. I have a Tiffany Nightmare Before Christmas Tiffany lamp um, that does not work, <laughs> but I will get it working someday. Um, it just needs new electronics <laughs> in it. But anyways, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I was thinking about movies that would be kind of a good thing to talk about. And, um, you know, obviously, like, I love Tim Burton movies. I think, like, they get so, they're really pigeonholed as, like, he has a lot of social pariahs, which is, like, hard to deny between, like, you think about Jack Skellington and Victor to some extent in Corpse Ride and Frankenweenie and Edward Scissorhands. I mean, that's, like, a big thematic theme of his, but... I was thinking about like what I do and, you know, what therapy looks like and, and just kind of movies that really thematically um, fit into what I do. And I was like, oh my gosh, Corpse Bride. Like, I love this movie. I know this movie, but it's also really interesting for me to revisit it in the context of relationships and stop thinking about it as like a story centered around Emily or Victor and start thinking about it as a movie about like relationships and and how we get our needs met in relationships and how we like communicate with other people about our needs. And I found that when I watched it that way, it became like extraordinarily comedic. I probably laughed at that movie today more times than I've laughed at anything. Um, Oh, that's funny. So like, I mean, let's, let's, let's get into it. So the story is basically starts out with meeting two sets of parents and I don't know. I mean, I guess like most Tim Burton movies, this is vaguely set in Victoria. Like Victorian era, London. Era. Yeah, I think it may be a li- a, on the yeah. later end of that. And also like just a fun fact. I don't know if you noticed this, but almost all of the introductions for Tim Burton movies are the same. So like in this one, we're following the butterfly around and Sweeney Todd, you're following a rat in Nightmare Before Christmas. You're following like the weird ghosties through Halloween Town and stuff. Like, if you start watching mm-hmm. all of Tim Burton's movies, like, just the first five minutes of them, they become eerily similar. Um, but, yeah. Huh. He definitely has themes. I mean, there's a dead dog right. in all of the movies. Um, there is the isolated, um, uh, maybe yeah. maladjusted, yeah. like, main character. A lot of relationship kind of issues. Um, so many relationship yeah, issues. Yeah. <laughs> But we meet these two sets of parents, and they are everything must singing. be perfect. <laughs> um, uh huh. And they're basically gearing up because they are going to meet right. each other, and their children are going to meet. And in one set, um, uh, Victor, so the Van Dorts, yep. which that's his last name, uh, their son is going to be the one who 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 marries, and then in the other, the Everglots, their daughter is going to be the one who. Who marries, and so I guess it's an arranged marriage because yes. the two of them, uh, Victor and Victoria, right. it is have an never arranged met. Marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so the parents are kind of singing, and they're getting ready for the meeting, and then they show right. up at the house, and they meet. And I think it's it, this is a really if you want to talk. So, like, I think therapeutically, and just just for everybody listening at home, like when I talk about people getting their needs met. I mean, we all have like basic needs, I think like food, water, shelter, but we also have needs in relationships to be understood, to feel safe, to, you know, like on, and again, on a basic level to have our financial needs met to, to feel secure, to feel loved and happy and fulfilled and, you know, all these things. So, you know, if you look at the two families, their needs are very, very opposing. And this match is kind of mutually beneficial for them both because the Everglots, like you find out in the process that they're bankrupt, that they have no money and that this marriage is basically the only thing that's going to keep them. Um, it's arranged marriage is the only thing that's going to keep them from losing, you know, being kicked out on the street, losing their house. And the Van Dorts, like per, the mom in particular is just really like has this idea that she's going to be, she literally says and rubbing out like a uh, rubbing elbows with her highness. Like, so, you know, she has this like envision that she's going to become like a noble person and, and really famous. And so these are like really, um, you know, families driving these needs. And then you have these poor kids that are kind of caught up in the middle. I do think it's really hilarious. Like, and I think it's a good example of how like performative behaviors and relationships. So the Everglot's house is like stripped down to nothing. It's just this big empty hall with no furniture and nothing in it. And, um, you know, the Van Dort, her, the wife, I can't remember his mom's name, but, um, 
she walks in and she's just like, oh, such, such grandeur, such elegance, such taste. And there's like literally yeah. nothing there. And I'm like, See, there it is. Like, that's yeah. what we do in relationships. It's inauthentic. But I think we all, you know, we've all been there where we've kind of felt the need to like fake it in order to preserve something or to make something happen. Um, yeah. And, and and who's to say that, I mean, like maybe since we never saw um, maybe the it Van is, Dort's yeah. house, you know, maybe theirs is even worse than that one. And so maybe to her, it really was like elegant and, and that kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, I do think that at least for the parents, it did seem like this, this marriage is very utilitarian. Like each wanted something. This was the match that was going to get right. what they wanted. Um, and so, and I, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, maybe that really was a thing. I mean, I know it was a thing in nobility. I don't know if it was a thing in like lower caste kind, right. of, kind of life, but. Well, and in modern times, I think that's what we call, you know, we it, call that settling. Um, I mean, I, I, well, there's still arranged huh. marriages, like obviously, you know. I, I think, but I think we do that, like if in terms of that being a metaphor, like, it, you know, you, you think about utilitarian relationships. I think a lot of people, especially early on in relationships end up with people because that's, a, I've talked to so many people where they end up married to somebody because they like lost their housing, you know? And so obviously yeah. like arranged marriages are still very much a huge part of certain cultures. And, and that's kind of a whole other thing. Um, but if you want to talk about like day to day, uh, you know, relationships, maybe, you know, saying in a Western sense where, you know, arranged marriages are not part of the culture might be a better way to describe that. But yeah. And maybe if it's not um, strictly utilitarian, like I need money, that person has money, I'm right. going to marry them. Um, it may be something along the lines of, you know, you know, these people got married or they're still together because I don't know if I can yeah. have anything else. And it doesn't mean that all those people have bad relationships and they, you know, there are lots of people that come out of those things with good relationships, but there are also lots of people that I think that are unhappy in their relationships because, you know, maybe they just don't want to be alone. Um, and don't, yeah. you know, are, are, you know, there's just, there's just lot, there's lots of different types of relationships. I don't want to pigeonhole anybody, certainly. But. Well, yeah, but we're, I mean, you know, we're right. just looking at this one between, between, between a two puppet puppets, and a puppet. Two mutually consenting puppets. Absolutely. Um, so they, they show up at the house. Uh, the parents all meet. Um, Victor finds a piano. He sits down, he starts playing, and Victoria walks yep. up on him. Right. And they meet. And um, after that, I think the next scene is they right. go to the church practicing their to practice mm -hmm. the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And the pastor, pastor, priest? Uh, pas pastor calls well. Pastor calls um, well. Okay. So the pastor, uh, played by yes. Christopher Lee, um, <laughs> Sordomon, um, is, I mean, I think intimidating would be understating right. the word. Um, cause I mean, I think like clearly Victor is a yep. timid character, but even a person who is not timid, I think just kind of putting themselves in Victor's shoes would have been intimidated right. by this pastor because he is like, you know, do it this way, say it, right. say your vows this way. Now hand that they, I mean, he is like a football coach or a drill instructor well, barking like orders, but hours. also Christopher Lee's voice. Yeah. And so Victor gets really freaked out, you know, really, really nervous. And it, it ends up with him, I think the next scene, he, he ends up going into the woods Right, well, practice. because it's, it's been disastrous. And they basically called off the wedding. And yeah. so you have all this pressure from both families. Like, you know, this wedding can't not happen. Like, this, this has to happen. And so, yeah, he ends up practicing his vows in the woods, which... By the way, this is based off a really old, um, like Russian Ukrainian folktale. Um, this is not like a purely out of Tim Burton's head. The, the the whole the whole idea of corpse bride is that yeah, this young man basically screws up his vows and he ends up accidentally proposing to a corpse. And when he's <laughs> alone in the woods, yeah. Oh, I got it. I got it right here. It's on IMDb. The movie is based on a 19th century Russian folktale, which Joe Ranft 
uh, who actually ended up working for Pixar. And if you've seen, I, I think it's Toy Story 2, Squeaky yes. the Penguin was huh. voiced by him. Um, he introduced uh, Burton to the story while they were finishing The Nightmare Before there Christmas. Uh, this movie began production in November of 2003, so 10 years after Nightmare Before Christmas. While Burton was completing Big Fish, he continued with production on his next live-action movie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which was produced simultaneously yep. with this movie. There we go. But but yeah, he ends yeah. up, you know, I find this this scene in particular, you know, I just think it's it's an interesting, you know, with the pressure off of him, he's able to do what he needs to do. And yeah, well, and I think I accidentally skipped over something too. At the wedding, um, Marcus yes. yeah, shows up, important. who, who I would say, I don't know if I really kind of grasped what his character was, who he was, what he was doing there, right. you know, until much later. But he shows up and says in a really creepy way, like, oh, I guess I'm really bad with dates right. and here a day early. Well, he's he's you really know. unsettling from the get-go. Um, I I kind of love his whole his whole character as like a metaphor for mental health issues and just how they like sneak in and wreak havoc on our lives. Um, obviously, uh, you know, he does a lot more than wreak havoc, but um, uh, you know, so yeah, lo long story short, you know, cause the movie is only 77 minutes, uh, if you can believe that, um, Victor ends up proposing to a corpse. And so he kind of finds himself in this, in this situation where he's. Well, accidentally, cause as he's practicing, he goes to put the ring on, I mean, uh, uh, what he thinks right. is like a twig or a branch. And, it, and then it turns out to be right. the corpse. It's a hand. dead lady. And so. He, yeah, like takes off running into the night and she follows him. And then, you know, she like kisses him and then he dies. Like, you know, you may now kiss the bride. And then he, well, not dies, but he faints and ends up in the, in the afterlife. Um, yeah, which I, I think that it was, I remember saying during the beginning of the movie, you know, this is a cartoon, which right. is not a cartoon, it's stop motion, but this is a cartoon and it's in black and white. And then after she kisses him and he faints, he goes to what I would assume is like right. the underworld. And in the underworld, everything is yeah. very colorful and bright. Whereas in the land of the living, everything right. is shades of gray. Which I think is a, is a pretty, I mean, you can take that metaphor wherever you want. Tim Burton came out and talked about how deliberate that choice was just because he's like, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I think what it means for me, you know, a lot of times our you know, our relationships of any kind, you know, friendships, partnerships, marriages, whatever, when they are good, they feel that way. They feel very full of life and very colorful. I think when things are bad in your personal relationships, it feels like the whole world has been stripped away. Um, you know, just like you're living in this very bleak, gray, you know, for all intents and purposes, utilitarian, you know, kind of going through the motions type thing. Um, and overall, like the people in the underworld are so much like are such a better example of what like how people should be, especially in relationships versus the people, the people upstairs, because, you know, the, neither Van Dort and his wife seem OK, but like she corrects him a lot and she's she puts him down a ton. And then he mm -hmm. nips him a lot. Yeah, even on the way there, she said something like, I always pictured I'd have more oh, than the oh. life. Fish uh, or the wife yeah, of a fish, fish merchant, whatever merchant. she says and then yeah. like victoria's parents the everglots just they're just awful they're just horrible people and they, that's true i do think it's really funny though the one scene where they meet and she tells her yes. husband to smile <laughs> and, and it's like it's like straining to flex <laughs> the muscles to, to right to get well and there. she i mean they have a whole they're talking to victoria about marriage and she's like well i thought don't she's like don't you like each other and they're like god no of course we don't like each other like what do you think this is which you know yeah. obviously is super unhealthy but um you know after so victor kind of wakes up in the underworld and then i think has a you know going back to the need his need to um run away uh, like escape because i think the whole next like 15 minutes of the movie are victor trying to like make sense of his situation and devise a plan to 
to get back. Yes. Yeah. I mean, initially it's just the shock of, oh man, right. All of these people are dead. Uh, and then almost as soon as he realizes where he's at, um, we get a song explaining the yes. corpse bride story. Basically that she wanted to, oh man, she wanted to marry somebody. I think her yes. parents said no. So her plan was to elope. She ran off to the woods yes. to wait for her With a, beloved. With a satchel of gold and, and while the family waiting, jewels. Yeah, yes. the, uh, yeah, the dowry, is that what it's called? Yeah. So she went to wait for that, and then while she was waiting, she she was murdered. Yeah, and he took off. The guy took off with all of the, uh, with all of the, yeah, took off. The guy that murdered, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, and actually the, the skeleton with the bowler hat that sings that song, his name is Mr. Bone Jangles, if you wanted to know. It is, and he's <laughs> voiced by Danny Elfman. Uh, it's a great song. But it's, well, and you... Who also yeah. Jack Skellington. And, you know, the thing that, again, this, this goes back to, you know, Victor, you know, has kind of had his whole world turned up. Well, literally has had his world turned upside down. And, she, you know, uh, Emily, the corpse bride, is just, you know, she's kind of got what she's always needed and wanted. And she is really initially pretty neglectful of, like, Victor and any consideration for him. Um, especially considering, like, she just dragged him to a whole nother, like, universe. Um, which kind of a, there's kind of a lack of consideration. It's like, Oh, are you okay? Oh, great. We're married now. Like we're going to live our life down here. Um, she does come around, but. Eventually. Yeah. So like, I mean, when you initially were, were pitching the movie, you, you mentioned, um, kind of, I think your exact words were, you have to put your foot down in a relationship, but you also right. have to compromise. Right. Tell me how so that So I think, you know, I'm thinking specifically, like, in, and not just in a marriage, because obviously this movie is very marriage-centric. Um, but if you look at, like the, like, the community relationships, the family relationships, I think, you know... There, there are really great moments where, where um, you know, people do, people do put their foot down. And I think, um, you know, Victor kind of slowly grows a backbone as, um, as the, whole, the whole movie progresses. But, you know, plot-wise, meanwhile, you know, back at the ranch, Victoria is, is freaking out. Um, and the whole length of the movie, she, you know, does not let go of the fact that, like, Victor has married a corpse and that he's not run off with some other woman, but that he's essentially been kidnapped, which is true to some extent. Um, you know, Victor, which in fairness, I mean, you know, I can understand having a tough right. time. So, but, but the point there is she, she doesn't, she does not quit with, like, anybody, which especially if you think about the time period set in for a woman to be that vocal, it's a pretty big deal. Um, and she, you know, insists to her parents and to the priest and everything else that something is wrong. Um, you know, I think the compromise especially comes, comes in the end of the movie. I was thinking about that today, but, you know, um, I think Victor, you know, especially in this part of the movie where he's kind of just gotten there is, you know, I need to go back, um, and is, you know, not... I, I appreciate that he's not just immediately like, okay, cool, this is fine, you know, but he he really works to kind of get his needs met. It's like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this, I'm going back. Um and and you know, makes those makes those efforts to do it, like doesn't do it in a very nice or healthy way, uh, I don't think. But he does, you know, he does yeah. kind of maintain, like, you know, I can't I can't do this. Um, which I think is important because I think in relationships, especially with people we care about, it, it it's easy sometimes to go along to get along. Um, and that's not what, what he does. Um, I think, um, you know, they, they do get to go back to the, the land of the living and he kind of tells, he, he tricks her into it, right? He's like, oh, we need, I need to introduce you to my parents. And so they're able to kind of go back for a little bit and he goes, you know, goes to Victoria at that point, which that scene cracks me up. Like, um, you know, the, the Emily and Victoria trying to decide who the other woman is. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I wonder if, I mean, it, it could be, which 
I think what you said is true. He doesn't necessarily learn to say what he wants in the nicest way. But I, I kind of see when he is, you know, downstairs, he, he does gain, and I, I don't know if it's fear-based or what, but he does gain the ability to at least take some more agency over his own life. Because um, certainly in the beginning, while he's upstairs, it seems like his parents are basically calling the shots. Hey, right. you're doing this. You're going there. You're marrying her. You're saying this. You're dressing this way. And then by, you know, being pulled uh, into the downstairs, he he really does kind of take control and and to a certain extent do whatever he can to go after what he wants, which in this case is getting back upstairs and and, and getting right. back to Victoria. Um. And I, I suppose in the process kind of really does hurt uh, the bride, uh, Emily. Because I know at one point he even said like, oh, well, why on earth would I right. want to You're dead. You? He literally says, why would I want to marry you? You're dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, on top of right. that, you kidnapped me. Um, and I didn't exactly realize. Well, I mean, I don't know if she understands that he didn't realize that he was marrying her. I mean, it's her hand. He put right. a ring on it. He said all these vows. I mean, well, I guess in her mind. He in really the song montage, the in the uh, in the song where they're explaining her whole situation, it did say that she was literally lay, like laying there waiting for somebody to come and propose. So I feel like she probably knew what yeah. her situation is, but like w- like what are the odds that anyone would rationally come to the conclusion like, oh, I'm going to go propose to like every tree branch in the woods and hope that it's a dead person? Um, probably not going to happen. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, and, and, you know, go ahead. But it does. <laughs> Well, I mean, it does, it makes me think about, I mean, just right. how passive that is. Because I think, it, and at least in the three main characters between the corpse bride, Victor, and Victoria, you have three people who, at least in their initial presentation, are just very, 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 yes. very passive people. And are really people who things happen mm-hmm. to. They, they don't really cause things to happen. Um, there's not really any intention there. And it, it reminds me of, um, so my, my wife is a giant Taylor Swift fan and I don't know, you know, Taylor Swift, cool. You know, I could take her or leave her. I don't like actively dislike her, but I don't really like her. I just kind of know that she's there. Um, but I, I know that, um, gosh, I guess it was last year sometime, like for her tour that she was doing and she was in Nashville, like my wife and some of her friends went to one of the concerts. And so, of course, in leading up to the show, uh, she, Taylor Swift right. music had to be listened to. Um, and I was struck by, and I don't remember if it was a certain album, but in a lot of the songs that I heard, it seemed like she was taking a mm-hmm. very passive stance. In, in these love songs like it was a lot of come and you know save me you know if oh uh the one i'm thinking of uh if you could oh man i can't remember how it went now but it was um mm-hmm. i think it was like romeo and juliet or something like that but it just it was like if you could just see that i cared about you you know you would leave whoever it is that you're with and you would you would realize that yeah uh, oh you belong to me that's the name of it oh my gosh and I just, I just thought to myself, oh, that just seems so sad because it seems like you're, you're unable to say how you feel and say what you want. And so the chances of you getting what you want, if you can't say it, uh, right. are slim to none. And it seems like, you know, part of at least Victor's journey, and I think in a very real way, the Corpse Bride's journey too, is learning to yeah, say Yeah, well, and I think when I originally, like, sent you that email, and um, what I was thinking, you know, relationships are a balance. You have to be able to do both. Sometimes you have to be able to compromise. Sometimes you have to be able to, um, you know like, uh, set a boundary, um, you know, and say, listen, like, these are my needs. And this is, this is, this is what I need to continue, you know, to be functioning and happy and fulfilled. And so, you know, and then being able to find balance in that everybody at the end of the movie. And this is the thing that I so firmly believe, you know, if you, if you can do both of those things, like everybody in the, at the end of the movie comes out so much better than they started. You have three very passive characters that end up with a huge amount of agency at the end of the movie. And I think it's because, you know, they're able to kind of 
communicate better and they're able to say, you know, this is what I'm doing. And they're, and they're also able to an extent, you know, able to compromise, um, you know, and, and I think Emily kind of starts the communication in the right direction. She finds Victor's dog scraps, like when she realizes that he's not happy. Um, Am I on plot with the movie? Have mm-hmm. I skipped major plot points? I've seen it so many times. It just, it's just oh, I don't think so. I mean, we're like we're we're going kind of back and forth. We talk a little, you know. We we jumped to the end a little bit. We came back. So, it's okay, you know. You know, right at this point, we're talking characters. But yeah, I mean, she finds his dog and brings his dog because she's like genuinely trying to help him acclimate right. to being right. downstairs. And so you know, there's like a you know, there's a a really great example of compromise, you know, to some extent she realizes like, if I want this to work out, you know, I have to be, you know, making sure that he's okay. And this can't just be about me celebrating getting married. Um, you know, cause I, I think at that point she kind of realizes that she, she dragged him into a little bit into it a little bit. Um, and I think around that same time as they're like angry piano duet, which is like maybe my favorite way of communicating ever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, who framed Roger Rabbit yes. between Daffy Duck and Donald Duck? That's that's <laughs> agree. my favorite. Well, I think of. it's it's what they are doing non-verbally is like I think a great example of like how and again, not just marital relationships, but all kinds of relationships, you know, where you're like they're both sitting there like kind of angry and frustrated and somebody hits a note and somebody else hits another note and you know, they they eventually are able to through that little duet kind of like come to a place where they're having, you know, um, you know, they're, they're kind of able to start building on what each other are doing and actually have a really nice little moment. Um, I just think it's funny. It's, it's such a, absolutely nothing is being said. And yet I'm like, I've been in this argument so many times, like I've had this, this same pattern of things happen. So that's it. So some point, while right. all this is happening, um, uh, yes. oh gosh, Barkus um, realizes that Victor isn't there, and I don't know if he knows about the corpse stuff, but somehow or another, the town crier like figures it out. So he is like yes. reporting the news by ringing a bell and screaming it, which is very similar to how right. the news so, is reported I love that today. Does it so like with um, this is like what I love about like so many of the Tim Burton movies is these little subtle moments where he's so loud that it's rattling the teacups. Yes. Oh, I thought it was a good touch too. I also yes. liked that he was shaped yes. like a bell and he was ringing a bell. Um. So the town crier says that Victor ran off with. Yes. I think he said a yes. corpse or something like that. Um, and then Barkus just kind of like subtly slides in there like, well, you know, we still need to have a wedding. And if Victoria really needs to get married, you know, I right. could, you know, I could do it, you know, this kind of thing. And then at some point in there, and I don't remember how it's revealed, but I mean, it's revealed that he was the corpse bride's yes. fiance. So if I, I don't think we technically like he reveals himself till the end where Emily kind of realizes like it was you. But if you look like when they're telling her story, it's the shadow on the wall is Lord Barkus. Um, mm-hmm, yeah. It's shaped like him because like all good animation. And I remember, I think ha- hearing this for the first time, uh, watching somebody from the Simpsons say it, the silhouette is yes. very important for the character. Like it needs to be that you can recognize the character with right. nothing other than the silhouette. And so in this right. case, his shadow right. is him. Like well, and, his, and yeah. You know, and so, shape. so you kind of figure that out and then it's like, Oh crap. Um, bad guy, which like, I never feel good about him. Like he is such a creepy sneaking, like sniveling weaselly. Like I don't have enough adjectives for how much I hate him, but you know, like, he just got a vibe. He's got a vibe. Um, I do. I, I I think I was thinking today because I was like rewatching this movie this morning and and kind of reflecting before I went to work and reflecting on um just like thinking of this through a therapeutic lens and I'm like you know isn't that just how like all of our maladaptive coping strategies not relationship related but like isn't that how all of that stuff just shows up where it sneaks in and it's like hey you know this is the easy thing to do um 
you know, you could like work out like, you know, you need to, or you could just eat like a whole gallon of ice cream. Like that's Lord Marcus. Um, it's, or you could do both. To the gym, get it on the treadmill. The <laughs> you on the treadmill. Solutions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so they go ahead with, the, they decide to go ahead with the wedding with Lord Barkus and then Mayhew dies. Um, Which was um, yes. Victor's parents' yeah. chauffeur. And so he has like a chauffeur. Yes. He, yeah, he drove I, the chauffeur. I, I, he, I feel like he probably had some other roles, but he's clearly like very close to the family. And so he, yeah, he like hacks up along and dies <clears throat> and shows up downstairs. And, um, in full color, yeah. In full color. And so prior to this, I think, because all these things are kind of happening simultaneously, prior to that, like, Victor and Emily have kind of um, come to an agreement that they, you know, Victor, oh, this is what happens, I remember. Mayhew comes down and says, Victoria's marrying someone else. And Victor decides, okay, well, if if I can't marry her, then I'm going to make this work with Emily, like since I'm already down here and decides to give himself away. Um, and so this is, I think, a really good illustration, this whole section where him and Victoria are planning the wedding. Everybody rushes in to help. Um, you know, I think both of them are really good about, you know, asking for what they need. And they even stand up and they say, you know, we're going to get married, but we need your help. We need the community's help. And so everybody pitches in for, you know, a cake and to fix up Victor's suit that gets ripped and to, to do all these things. And I think that's, you know, a really great, really, really great example there of what can happen when you, in relationships, when you ask for what you need, um, if you're, you know, with a good supportive bunch of people, that's, you know, everybody shows up for you. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, one thing that I, I tell people is asking for what you need is always scary because you're right. exercising vulnerability and vulnerability is a display that you have limits. You have limitations. You can't, you can't do everything. You can't provide everything that you need. It's literally saying, I can't do this. Can you please help me? And that's a scary thing. Like if, if intimacy is a scary thing, then that's because to get it, you have right. to pay the price of vulnerability. Um, but, and you know, people have all kinds of excuses as to why they don't want to do that. Like, well, you know, I wouldn't want to bother them or I wouldn't want to, you know, this, that, or the other. And I always say, well, why don't you let them decide that? Like, why don't you, why don't you ask for what you need? And if the other person can and they want to, then they will. Right. And if they can't, they'll right. tell you exactly. that. And that's okay. Um, it's okay for you to ask and it's okay for them to respond in what, whatever way that they mm -hmm they want to respond. Um, in this case though, I, I think that, you know, for the most part, it, it, this is what I think my experience as a person has been. I think a lot of others is if, if you can ask for what you need in a really authentic way and you can be vulnerable with your feelings about it, for the most part, that draws something out in others and it creates in them this desire to, oh, absolutely. to help. I, to you know, way. I've said for a long time that if, if it were not for the support of others, I, I honestly wouldn't be here. Um, you know, I have had people, you know, feed me, let me do my laundry, you know, really just take care of some basic needs. But I've also had people like show up, um, you know, for very little things that ended up meaning a great deal to me. And, you know, not all of our, not all of my clients are surrounded by um, supportive family necessarily, but, you know, there's no reason why everybody can't have a community, whether that's a couple of people or whether that's, you know, 40 or 50 people, um, you know, and, and, it's a, uh, I feel like it, for Victor in particular, it was really, that's not his community, but you know, he was, which makes, I think it, you know, all the more vulnerable. That's one of the biggest things. And, and, um, when you marry somebody, I think that you, you, you know, becoming a part of their community in a positive way. And certainly that doesn't happen for everybody, but this is a really good example, I think, of how good those things can be. Yeah. So they're they're deciding that he well he's deciding he's going to make this work and one of the ways that I, I guess it it has to happen in order for it to work is right. they say well he's got to yeah. be dead. So then uh, there's um I don't know yeah. like a potion. It's a uh, it yeah is. it's like the like death causing wine. Um yeah the wine of ages that's what they call it the wine of ages yeah he's got to drink. <laughs> Yeah. 
But it's going to make right. him it's have a heart just attack. Poison. And it's just die. really fancy poison. Yeah. So, um, gosh, I, I, I'm, I lost how, how we get to the part at the end. So, they go so because he has to die, he has to go back to the land of the living and, like, die in that plane for some reason. That's, like, I think it's kind of a battle, but they have oh. to go back upstairs and have no, 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 no. That makes sense. You've got to be, you've right. got to be in the to land go, of the living to, to die, to to come down there. Like, because if you die, if you die maybe downstairs, maybe you, maybe I don't maybe, know, you're, maybe, maybe that's just, how you make zombies. You, you die downstairs, you come right. back upstairs as a dead person, and now right. you're a zombie. Well, and theoretically, and like away. I, I think because I think he's just technically a visitor. Like, because that's what they say about Emily. Like when she goes upstairs, is that she's like visiting. Um, so, which I think is a, they also, yeah, she uses a Ukrainian haunting spell, but in this case, yeah, they have to go back upstairs. And so they get the community, um, rallied around them to, to go make this thing happen. And I do think, you know, it's not insignificant that Victor and Emily have really like made an effort to communicate and to talk to each other. And, and, you know, he kind of hears, he overhears just how upset she is and, and you know, that she really cares and wants to make this work. And so he decides, all right, you know, it might not work right now, but I'm committed to, you know, figuring this out. And so, yeah, they, they end up with a cake and which I love the cake. Like if I was going to have a wedding cake, I would want that cake. Like just, just this giant, like five foot tall cake decorated with bones. It's my favorite part of the whole movie. Um, and also that it moves like jello, which is pretty funny. So they go back upstairs and they, yeah, <laughs> they, they invade the church where Victoria's wedding is happening to Lord Barkus where that's happening. And so, so they go in there and, you know, I think, um, or they are already in the church. I, I think they invade the church cause I know the pastor tries to keep them out and he, he has this yeah. favorite part where he like tells them like, you know, the, this is a holy ground and you cannot come in. And they just walk past him and the guy goes, we're in a church. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and there's the part where like, as they're like getting there, they encounter yes. like a little kid and, and one of them as like a skeleton or something's getting closer and closer. And then he just picks the kid yeah. up. Yeah. And, the and kid so they kind of realize, says, well, and then, yeah, we're kind of, there's kind of this whole end section where the dead come up and they come up, um, they come up in the Everglot's house as well. And I think that's because they Victoria and Lord Barkers have already been married and the dead come up in their house and they get kind of carried off to the church in the process. Um, I believe is what happens. Or Victoria finds out that they're getting married and then goes to the church to stop it. Maybe that's what happens. Uh, for watching this movie, I'm not doing a really good job maintaining plot points. But... <laughs> Well, it's tricky when you're trying to like talk back through yes. like analytically rather than just happened. like, you know, yeah. Uh, so, out which of stuff I, like yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, if you want to talk about like, you know, all these people are literally confronted by their dead family members and, and, you know, um, I find they're in like their little, that wedding feast where they have like this little, these little tiny chickens and like a quarter glass of wine and, um, Barkus gets up to toast and like just, talks you know is talking about himself and then the camera pans over to victoria's face and she just looks like she wants to die um you know mm. it, it's kind of a kind of a rude awakening and i think you know again with the metaphors but you know I, again the family baggage comes back to haunt us literally you know that's the same i once heard uh somebody yeah. say when you marry somebody and you go to bed at night there's six people in the bed there's you and your partner and both of your parents. Um, I think that that's very it, Willy Wonka. It in the is very Willy Wonka, but, but it yeah. is true. You know, I think we we bring the things we bring in from our family and from our past tend to affect our relationships. And you know, you don't need to be a therapist to see that all over this movie. Um, especially when he says, you know, my grandfather would be turning in his grave, and then his grand he turns around, his, grand, his grandfather just doesn't care and starts asking for the spirits. Um, yeah. So they all end up at the church. Yeah. Victoria, I think Victoria goes to the church because she finds out Victor's back and she goes back to stop the wedding. In the process of that, Emily realizes that like Victor's going to basically kill himself for her and kind of puts a stop to it and is like, you know, I can't ask you to do this. 
Um, He's literally getting ready to drink the wine of ages. Yeah, she, she literally puts her hand over the top of the glass in. and is like, you know, I can't. I think at that point she realizes, and she says, like, I've been selfish. Um, my dreams were stolen from me, and now I've gone and stolen them from someone else. And so. Yeah, which I feel like that that yes. is such a beautiful line. And it's it's such a a beautiful moment of self-realization that, like, something was taken from me and it caused me pain. It caused, or, or, or like, I guess in, if we're talking about the context right. of what you mentioned earlier, it caused me trauma and, and in an effort to, I would say not deal with it, but I'm sure in her mind, right. it's in an effort to deal with it. She's actually inflicting that yeah. same kind of thing on somebody else. And it wasn't until the, yeah. And it wasn't until the end where she kind of, it like kind of came into focus, like, oh man, I'm doing this because this was done to me and I don't want to right. perpetuate that cycle. Right. And so she, she decides that she's not going to do it. And, um, you know, again, I think she realized that, you know, she was forcing her needs and, and pushing so hard to get her needs met that she ended up, you know, really hurting other people too. And I, I think that's where this, the, you know, the balance, co you know, coming in is important. I, you know, it's hard not to look at Vic, uh, Victor and Emily and not look at them as like a little codependent in some moments, like, Oh, you're not okay. Well, I'll just kill mm -hmm. myself and marry you. Just like marry you in the land of the dead, just so that this is okay. Um, if you wanted to look at it that way. Yeah. So like you do, that's, that's one way to look at it. Um, so yeah, she stops the wedding and like, you know, they, right as they're about to like have a conversation between the three of them, uh, Lord Barkus shows up at the church. Yeah. And goes at on the this, church. and, yeah. and at, yeah. at that point that Emily realizes like, and all the people and, you know, from downstairs realize like, this is the man that murdered her. Okay. Sorry, cat. No, sorry. There's a cat on my keyboard. Um, his, his name is Lewis. He is annoying, <laughs> but he's cute. It, right. If basically, not for sits, why um, I think it's just, I think he's just needing attention because those are his needs that he's expressing to me right now. Um, but yeah, they realize like, this is the guy and he goes on like this big, long pedantic speech, like bad guys often do. And he picks up the wine and you can kind of, right. He's, he's, he's yeah. monologuing. So he, uh, you know, talks about how awesome he is and he basically, you know, throws Emily under the bus and is like, you know, you're not worth anything. And at some point too, he realizes that the Everglots are like broke. Um, because Victoria tells him. Oh, I think he says something about like, oh yeah, I needed the dowry for blah, blah, blah. And then they're right. like dowry. We right. Victoria anything. tells like, them like, can't. yeah, that's, yeah. He said, I mean, you know, I'm going to be rich now and take all your money and whatever. And she's like, yeah, we were broke. Like your, our marriage so she says, my marriage to you was keeping my family from the poorhouse. Um, and then he goes on, yeah, more monologuing. And um, he ends up drinking the wine of ages and dies. And then uh, the the people, the dead people from downstairs kind of, uh, I don't know, dismember him or do whatever it is that they do to him. Yeah, I think that, um, I think that they... Something is keeping them from being able He's to not like, dead. touch the living. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, there's some kind of rule well, or something where they can't. Right. So I think what, what Elder Goodnick, um says is that we're on, I think he literally says we, we're, on, we're on their turf. We have to play by their rules. Like, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then he drinks the stuff and and is gonna do like a really dramatic, yes. sweet like walk away. And as he starts walking away, he starts like coughing and he clutches at his chest and he falls against the door. And then right. when he turns around, he's in full color, he's which dead. is the yeah. like clue that he's he's now dead. And then at that point, the chef lady was like, "Oh, a new arrival!" Right. And then they and all you know out. in. In the midst of all this, you know, Victor fights back and and kind of, you know, grows a spine. And um, it's really a good moment, I think, because all three of them definitely talk back to him. And that's the first, I think, real, you know, agency that we see where they're all, you know, kind of 
and if he's a, you know, if he's a metaphor for mental illness, it's a great metaphor for therapy. You know, when clients get to that stage of change where they're ready to like start talking back to maladaptive coping strategies and, you know, all kinds of stuff, but yeah. Oh, you are narrative. Yeah. yeah you're yeah. externalizing no, that's, the issue. That's like what that. I do. I, I think, you know, question you asked me in the beginning, you know, how is I, so I had taught English. Um, so narrative therapy has always come very, very natural to me. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of people have a hard time with it, but I, it's, yeah. you know, story. That's what I deal with my clients all day long is what, what's the story about. So anyways, they stand up to him and he gets what's coming to him and hopefully gets dismembered because we don't like him. And, um, you know, the thing that I think, uh, you know, everybody's kind of got what got their needs met in the end, um, in a, in a, in a pretty healthy way, but Emily kind of has her last little speech and she basically says like, I'm going to go. And, um, Victor's like, but I thought, you know, but I thought we were going to get married. I'll still marry you or whatever. And, and she says, you've given me my freedom and basically says, that's what I needed, you know? And she realizes she didn't need the wedding. She needed her, her freedom from her baggage. And she, right. She needed to find herself again. Because when she was in the woods, and even up until then, it, making, she was still so yeah, focused on like her. the mm-hmm. other, the other person. Like I'm not going to be complete until there's this other person. And I think what what he was able to, and I don't know if I can say that he gave this to her, but he was certainly someone right. who helped her discover it herself. But you know, she was able to find. Well, what is it that I want? Is right. this the kind of relationship that I want? somebody who isn't necessarily like intentionally wanting to be with me or do I want something different? And then, and through that process, you know, was able to kind of take herself back from right. this loss that she experienced. And you know, revenge is good too. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. You know. So, but yeah. And I, I love, I love, love, love the metaphor. So at the end, there's this beautiful moment where she like, dissolves into butterflies um, and leaves Victor and Victoria behind to live happily ever after. Um, Which like the butter, I I love butterflies as a metaphor for change, Um, which like is, yeah, well, it's a very obvious one. However, you know, what I explain to my clients all the time is that the part where the caterpillar is in the chrysalis is really gross and painful. Um, like from, from what I've read and understand, like they, they kind of like liquefy a little bit, like they get all goopy and gross and weird. Um, and so yeah. that's the part I like reminding people of is that, you know, yes, like you were a caterpillar and one day you'll be a butterfly, but therapy is the, is the goop in the middle. Uh, that's really unpleasant while you're trying to grow your wings. Um, Yeah. And I, I tell clients too, you know, my hope is that when you walk out of a session that you're going to think it was productive. Sometimes you're going to walk out and you're going to say, that was great. Like I feel incredible that, and and you would classify that as quote unquote good. Sometimes you're going to walk out feeling like you just went to war, but that's because we're wrestling with real life issues. And when you wrestle against the tough stuff, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough. And when you come to have closure or when you celebrate moments of victory, it's going to feel good. Both of those things are productive in that they're getting you closer right. to health and they're getting you closer to wholeness. And so it's my hope that any session you walk out of is going to be productive, right. not necessarily quote unquote good. Yeah, I've just got a speech about goop. <laughs> but... <laughs> I like goop. I think what you got to do though is you got to get some of that like um, crazy yes. man's thinking putty, but this you got to get clear right stuff, and then and then you pull that out and you have the goop, and you're like, look, and then you like squeeze your fist and it runs through your fingers, yes. like, look, this is yeah. What it is. So you know, okay. and and Victor and Victoria, I think he does. Victor says like the prettiest thing uh, that I like. I. I, uh, I like to quote this to my partner all the time, but um, he says to Victoria from the, he says like, I, you know, I was really scared about the wedding and everything else. He says, but the moment I, from the moment I saw you, I felt that I should be with you always. And so 
Yeah. And so, oh, you know, he great. says that to her and, and, you know, they have this, you know, that like, that's where he's supposed to be. Cause it's in the movie, but also like, that's the genuine relationship. That's, you know, that's where that connection is. And he kind of realizes that, um, Victoria is his person. Um, which I think is a great, you know, not necessarily technical therapeutic concept, but that's, you know, we have our people, not just in our significant relationships, but, you know, we have family members and things like people like that who are our people that we just feel really connected to. Um, and those are, those are ultimately the relationships we should be investing in. Um, you know, not so much with people who are trying to convince us to be or to do something that's not authentic to who we are. Yeah, but I think sometimes it can be tough to see. I mean, like, certainly like Emily, sometimes if we focus so much on, mm -hmm. you know, something that's happened in the past, we lose sight of right. what, what can happen in the present. Um, and that's not to minimize right. anything in the past that anybody's gone through. Mm -hmm. That's just to say we all, we all need help. And so, you know, for anybody that, that may be, has something in the past that's that's tough to move past um I, I would invite you to reach out reach out to somebody that you care about reach out to a therapist reach out and ask for help because it doesn't it doesn't always have to um, right be something that defines who you are well and that's you know again i think i think this whole movie you know how would things have been different if people would have asked for help from the beginning um we wouldn't have a great piece of cinema but but also you know um I don't know that True. I don't know that Victor and Victoria with their parents necessarily would have gotten anywhere. Um, but you know, what, what would have happened if, if Victor would have asked, you know, a, a friend or somebody else for, you know, for help um, with his vows or something else, you know, we might, might not be here. Could ask, probably could ask Mayhew. Mayhew probably would have helped him out. That's so. true. Right. Yeah. In between all the coughing. In, in between the tuberculosis. Yeah. Um, so, Oh yeah, yeah, it got him and it got Doc Holliday in Tombstone. Um, well, Andy, let's say that there's somebody that is listening today who just thinks, "Wow, she is so great. I feel like I could connect with her uh, so much, and I'd love to see her as a client." Um, how could? And also, since you're not right. in Nashville, you're in Indiana. I, I would yes. assume because of the way that the law works. Yes, they would. Uh, they would need to also be in Indiana. Um, but let's say that they wanted to get a hold of you to see as a client. Uh, that would um, be um, best way would be my email, which is Andy. That's A N D I dot Gregorick G R E G O R E K at Inwell I N W E L L dot org. So that is my that is my work email. And that's how you would do it. Boom. I love it. Um, well, Andy, it has been incredible to have Thanks. you on today. Um, and I'm super stoked that you picked this movie. I, I At the end of it, because I watched it again. Um, <laughs> here's a fun fact. I don't know how time zones work. Um, when I <laughs> was trying to arrange for us to be able to tape, and I said, cool, let's do it on Monday. I thought it was going to be... 10 30 right. for me yeah no, i thought i was me. ahead of you it's the opposite um, i should have known it turns out it's the opposite in, so i places. booked us to where it was yeah um North. i don't know where indiana's at that's the problem i th i think that indiana is gotcha Illinois. i think that's where yeah, I directly it above kentucky um and so yeah, so I like I messed that up, and so um, <laughs> I like when you like texted me like, "Hey, I'm ready to record." I was Oops. I was literally getting ready to see a client like right then, uh, and I was like, "Whoops!" Um, but in leading up to that, I had gotten to the office like an hour and a half ahead of time, and I watched the movie a second time. Leanne and I had watched it the night before, and then I watched it again. Um, and it's great. I mean, it's Tim right. Burton. It's stop motion. What more do you want? Uh, yeah, it's one of my all-time favorites. Um, yeah, I love yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for having well, me Andy, on. It's been thank a you so pleasure much catching again. up with you. Hi, Leanne. Hello. Did you have a Hello. Did you have a happy Star Wars day? Yeah, yeah, it was.
was fine. I didn't do anything Star Wars related. How stoked were you to celebrate Star Wars Day and Cinco de Mayo back to back? Oh my gosh. I got to tell you, I do love Star Wars, but it is nothing compared to my love of Mexican food. I was born for Cinco de Mayo. I'm not even talking about like the margaritas and the beer and stuff. Y'all can keep all that. Chips and salsa, Mexican food, other sorts of dips. I What other sorts of dips are there? You know, like seven layer dip, guacamole, cheese dip. Let me ask you a personal question. Okay. <laughs> what is it about seven layer? Why did they settle on seven for the amount of layers? Why are there not more layers? Why are well, there not less layers? It, well, it probably is just because those are all the things that went together. Like, there wasn't, there's not more things. It, they ran out of ingredients with seven? Yeah. Or they just said, like, oh, this is a really good dip. What should we call it? Well, how many ingredients are in it? Seven. Oh, okay, cool. Seven layer dip. There you go. That is how, historically, that is how that conversation went. Huh. I know. <laughs> I kind of imagined it was something similar to the story of that cleaning thing, uh, Formula 409, the spray. It's called Formula 409 because they kept going back to work on it. Like they tried one and it didn't work. They tried two, it didn't work. It took them 409 tries to get it and then they got it. So I was kind of imagining seven layer dip was like they tried just having dip with one ingredient. And they were like, this is garbage. And then they tried adding one more ingredient, and they were like, this is slightly less garbage. And then once they mm. got to seven, they were like, Eureka, we've done it. Yeah, but here's the thing. Dips <clears throat> with just one ingredient are not garbage. So that could not have been the case. Well, clearly they didn't want to stop with one, so yeah. there was some reason behind it. I think they just wanted to see what they would all taste like together. And thank goodness, because what would our world be without a good seven-layer dip? I mean, it'd still be okay. We still got nacho cheese. And no, it would not be okay. <gasps> guacamole and things oh, like that. There is cheese in a seven-layer dip, but not really nacho cheese, but <laughs> still cheese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So this week, uh, talked to Andy about Corpse Bride. Uh huh. Um, which I gotta say, big fan, big fan of Tim Burton. Huge fan. Huge fan of stop animation. Um, and I really liked this movie. <laughs> well, that makes sense because of all the things that you just said. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to give us like a... You thought there was a butt coming. Yes. It, it, the, way you, the way that you were talking, it did sound like there was a butt coming. Um, yeah, same. I mean, I don't... I You know, yeah, sure. Tim Burton, it's great. Stop motion, it's great. I love the nightmare before Christmas. Well, oh, well, so I, I got to say this. Like when I told you what we were going to watch, I got the impression when I initially told you that you weren't stoked on it. No, no, no. I like, no. When you told <clears> me <throat> that we were going to watch Spirited Away, I was very upset. <laughs> because gotcha. I saw Spirited Away in college and I did not enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I will say I've gotten a lot more uh, cultured. And <laughs> well, that's what marrying, educated. That's what marrying me will do to you. <laughs> no, no, no. That's true. I'm very Listen, unrefined. I lived in a big city. I went to museums. I'm just kidding. <laughs> say, say where you lived. Come I on. lived in New York. Come on, Britta. <laughs> Come on, Britta. Uh, I lived in whatever. New York. No, I don't mean it like that. I used to get bagels. Whatever. I just mean that I have come to appreciate the you finer know, things. I've Pam. come. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> I've come to appreciate, you know, things that are different from, like, what I would normally, I don't know, watch, read, encounter in my life. So maybe if I watch Spirited Away now, I would feel differently. But well, at I gotta, the time, I hated it. Yeah, I got a feeling like we're going to end up watching it because I watched a really good video on it on YouTube on Movies oh with no. Mikey. Ugh. And now I really want to see it. Well... But, uh, like I said, there, I mean, the reason why we didn't do it, I, I said this to Andy on the episode, is because it's not available for streaming. Like, we'd have to find a DVD or Blu-ray of it. Oh, good. I'm going like go we to some the kind of <laughs> Like, we were some kind of ancestors from the past or something <laughs> like that. In the way that our ancestors 
uh, foraged for food, we would have to do that to find a <laughs> DVD or Blu-ray. Well, I'll just keep my fingers crossed that we don't find it. Good Although I'll, I'll give it another chance. But also, anyways, Amazon would be pretty easy to find it. I guess. All of that to say, I was not. Um, I didn't have any negative feelings about watching Corpse Bride. Also, I had seen the Corpse Bride before and yeah. liked it. Yeah. So no, I like this movie. There wasn't anything cool. um, that I didn't like about it. So what did you think about the uh, the interview? As usual, Joshua, <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I got to mix up what I say because you ask me how was it, and I am i haven't gone back and listened, but I'm sure that I say it was great, <laughs> like every time, um, but it really wasn't, <laughs> so <laughs> next time I'll have something better to say. Um, but yeah, Andy seemed really cool. Um, I thought it was kind of funny at the beginning when she was talking about teaching, um, I... Well, A, I did not go into the teaching field very far. I was an early childhood education major in undergrad. For how long? Uh, a while. I mean, I I was a math major for my, like, first or, s- like, maybe my whole freshman year, but it might have just been first semester, and then um, <coughs> realized that the type of math that I love, which is, like, calculus and stuff like that is not the type of thing like you you teach that stuff to high schoolers and I did not want to teach high schoolers and so I thought well I really I had worked with younger kids a lot like in high school and I thought well I really like that so I guess I'll do early childhood um but as I started that and then I and then I did get pretty far I think I got to the beginning of my junior year maybe um before I was kind of exploring other options and I literally typed in a google search like a major that's close to education a major that's close to well you know what is a major that's close to education so that I could graduate soon (laughs) enough like I like I really thought like what's something that's close enough to it that I don't have to do a whole lot of extra time at school but also it's different so I'm not doing it (laughs) um and I found social work and it really was like something lit up inside me it was a magical moment um but all that to say getting up and going to the practicum um uh, for teaching I just identified with what Andy was saying like she was saying she liked the kids but like didn't you know, wasn't excited necessarily to, about the job, like going in every morning. Um, and I thought that's a cool, I mean, I think that's an important question to ask ourselves. A- and if, if there's anybody who's in a situation where they m- might have like the opportunity to make a change, I just think it's a good question. Like not that everybody loves going to work all the time, but you should enjoy the, you know, what you're doing. Um, and it's just, if, or I should say, if you do enjoy what you're doing, it's rewarding. It's worth it, you know, to pursue yeah. something that you love. And I think I think the ability to choose your vocation based on what you enjoy is a privilege. Yes, definitely. And so I think that, I mean, yeah, to somebody who maybe doesn't have that privilege, I would say it would be an equally important <coughs> question to um like victor frankel says to know your why yes ooh, it, I like that. uh frankel said that uh a, a man can get through any what as long as he has a good why so you know maybe to those listeners that that have a chance to choose a job that they love that's a, that's amazing yeah. what a great what a great opportunity to those who maybe don't have that chance then they their work gets to be why am i doing what i'm doing because i think that to put clothes on your family's back to put a roof over their head to put food on their table is chips and salsa in their plate it's true that would go under the food category (laughs) um would be would be extremely noble and extremely worthwhile Yes, I agree. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. I'm glad that you said that. I didn't I didn't think about it that way. But that's why, I mean, I, I just think if you have a chance yeah, um, to do something you love, it's worth pursuing. It's sure. worth taking some risk for yeah. as well. Um, which also in, r- in the teaching 
segment of <laughs> the episode. Um, she was talking about how she had students coming to her to talk about issues that they were experiencing at home or like she did say that like she had some coming to her with like suicide plans and somewhere in there she mentioned how other teachers were kind of like oh no like I'm not getting that and I just thought I bet that those students knew that she was a safe place and I think that's really 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 cool that she was able to be that for some kids so (laughs) Uh, after, once you guys moved on from the little teaching part, um, you were talking about, you were talking about like trauma and I think you were talking about childhood trauma maybe. And she made the comment that it can take people a while to realize what, that what happened to them is trauma. And I really liked that. And I thought, I just think, I think, I guess that's really important to acknowledge like the ways that you've been hurt and to acknowledge the things that have happened to you even if it's not trauma I think there's a lot of damage that happens when we don't you know recognize what our wounds are and give them space and time to heal and like pay attention to them like I think if you ignore something that wounded you even if it was in childhood that it's going to keep, it's just going to keep having an impact on your life. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I just like that she said that. Yeah. Andy, Andy mentioned that she uses a lot of, uh, narrative practices in her therapy. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's important in, in narrative, uh, modality, which Aaron Carr talked about this on the episode we did on arrival. Uh, one thing that's really important is language. Hmm. And I have, um, thought for a long time, that people cannot um, progress with an idea, people cannot frame thoughts, people cannot encapsulate pieces of their story without the language to do so. And I think that there's something in trauma work about that as well, in the sense of if a person maybe doesn't know that something that's happened to them is trauma but they have this feeling on the inside that something doesn't sit right with it Mm -hmm. that something didn't feel good about it um to kind of have that highlighted and to be given language around it Mm. i think language has the power to unlock things inside of a person that gives them a chance to um process it yeah. And so uh, it's another reason why, you know, I'm such a giant advocate for and a practitioner of therapy, because to have a trained professional to sit with you and be able to listen and to highlight things and not in a way that's like, oh, look at that. And then they're out the door. Yeah. But yeah, then to yeah. walk with you through the process of, uh, well, processing that, <laughs> um, I think it's such a tremendously powerful thing. And um, and yeah, as far as not knowing or realizing that, that trauma has happened, I think that language can, can help with that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a little bit later on, um, when you guys were talking about the movie, she, Andy said, Andy was talking about when the, when mm, Victor is the guy's name. Johnny Depp, yeah. Yeah. When his parents walk into Victoria's parents' house and the mom says, oh, the grandeur, you know, even though it's like empty. I'm sorry. I'm just going to pause one <laughs> sec. Um, I knew you were going to do that. Can you please do that impression again? No, she did the voice. She did it much better than I did. I know. You but can rewind and listen. But to I love you it. and I want to hear you do it again. <laughs> Oh, the grandeur. <laughs> 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 Anyways, the whole point of that was to, she ended up talking about how sometimes people can like fake it to get something out of relationships or like for, just for a reason, you know, whether that's to stay in the relationship or to continue getting something from the relationship. Did she use the word utilitarian? You did. I did. Okay. Um, And I thought, oh yeah, I've done that. Um, and especially when she mentioned 
or you mentioned, I'm not sure which one of you said this, but like, you know, faking it to stay in a relationship so that somebody doesn't have to be alone. I thought, mm-hmm. oh yeah, I've, I've definitely done that before. And, um, I just, I thought that was a good, like, uh, question to just reflect back on. Like, it, are there times where we fake it, you know, ignore either our thoughts or our needs, um, or wants for the sake of keeping the peace? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just had this thought, which I, I mean, when we were talking about this before we started tape and I didn't, but I think it's, it's possible to have a utilitarian philosophy in relationships to get something and to avoid something. Oh yeah. So like in their case, you know, they were looking at this as a way of getting money, uh, as a way of getting security. But we also, you just mentioned, you know, being in relationship as a way to avoid loneliness. Mm, And I think, I think it would be important and I'm, I'm glad you, you posed the question, but to have people reflect on, you know, why am I in this? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that getting something from a relationship is bad. Certainly, you know, any relationship, our marriage, each of us gets something out of it. Um, And I, I think it would be, it would be a good question to just reflect, why am I in this? What am I getting? Because, and, oh, here it is. The missing ingredient would be, am I being my true self? Yes. And yes, so am yes, I yes. getting something authentic because I'm being my true self? Mm-hmm. Um, because you were saying faking it to get something. Yeah. Which I think if you're not, I love, I love how much you guys talked about um, needs and like asking for what you need. Cause I think that, that, co- that feeds into this as well. If you, if your if your needs aren't being met and you're accepting that mm-hmm. just to keep the peace or for some other reason that is that's worth addressing because like there that means that there's a part of you you know your vulnerabilities in in the form of your needs that you're not sharing or expressing um which means that you're not being your true full self with that person yeah and if i'm not being my real self then I'm cheating you and I'm cheating me. Mm-hmm. If I'm if I'm pretending, I'm cheating me because I'm not letting myself be who I really am. So I'm I'm always playing a role. If I'm not being myself, I'm cheating you mm-hmm. because I'm I'm selling you a bill of goods. And I I I remember saying to people before, you know, if in the process of a relationship you know, you behave one way at the beginning and then you uh, change in an unauthentic or a genuine way, mm-hmm. way uh, in the relationship and you keep that going. You're cheating the partner because you're not being the person they fell in love with. Like you may be giving them what you think they yeah. want, but real is always going to be better than fake. Yeah, for sure. Which like also want to say the reason the reason this stood out to me and the reason we're talking about this is because and I know you've said this before we started recording we've both done this like and I think there's even times now where I will try to you know if if something comes up and I'm afraid to express a need um one of my many faults is that there there are times where it takes me just a little a little bit to express something that like is going on um And yeah, so I I think I just want to say that because it's not like, I don't know, we're not, there's a lot of different reasons behind why people do things they do. And we're not, we don't have it all figured out. We've both, we've just both been in situations where it's not like, or at least, and I'm speaking for you here just because of I'm married to you. So, you know, pipe in if this isn't true, but like, it seems like we've both been in situations where we have not been our real and full and true selves and it it has been to you know at to the detriment of of the relationship that we were in yeah i i I think i would hope that nobody hears this show whether it's the intro the interview the outro or any part of it and thinks that we're trying to communicate that we've got it all together 
I, yeah. I would hope that. And I think that part of growing up and part of developing as a person is to try your best in relationships. And certainly sometimes you're going to try your best and your best might be making choices that later on down the road you don't necessarily see as being wise or being for your best interest. And that mm-hmm. could have been, you know, playing a role and 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 faking it. Um, nobody, I was going to say nobody on this show, which is two of us right now, <laughs> Nobody on this show would would judge you for that because we've all done it. It's it's yeah. it's part of that, and so it's another example of of what I would say is just you know you get a bad pace of be pl- you get a bad case oh, no. of being a I know we're recording too early. I know <laughs> you we're at our best. It turns out when it's mm, really late at night the day yeah. before. <laughs> you got a bad case of being a person. Um, welcome to the club. Yeah. Um, so I I, I hope that I- if you were listening to that, you know. Please don't, please don't think that we're saying it from any position other than shoulder to shoulder with you. Yeah, which I don't think, I mean, I don't think we were. I just wanted to throw it out there because that's, I think, one of the points of the podcast is for movies to illustrate things that we can take into our real life and real relationships. Yeah. Um, so I think the last thing that I wanted to, like, talk about was something that you said Towards the end, which towards the end for me meant on my way home from work was when I was listening to it, which is like an hour. So to be honest, it could be, it it might not be at the very end, but you were talking about, um, oh, it was at the end because you're talking about the end of the movie where Emily decides to, you know, let Victor and Victoria get married and she turns into butterflies and stuff, which P.S., Taylor Swift reference. Um, Listen, Mariah Carey did that way before <laughs> Taylor not Swift. I'm not saying she invented it. Chill out. Um, you pointed out that she was, the way that she was trying to deal with what had happened to her was to fix it by getting married. You know, and then you also kind of said like, you know, or she wasn't dealing with it because she was trying to, she was focused on getting married and not like dealing with what had happened. And I just thought that is a perfect example of how it doesn't work out when you try to fix something that's going on in you with another person. Like, you know, for example, if I get this boyfriend, I'm not going to feel insecure about this. Or, you know, Dak Shepard talks a lot about um, what's his way that he says it. Oh, that like he has the same kind of thing that he thought if he would date a certain type of girl that he would basically feel better about himself. Um, and that's not true. And I think similarly, you know, there's not there's not anything that another person is going to do that can repair or heal past trauma or wounds if you aren't willing to also like address it and deal with it within yourself first. Yeah. Yeah. I like the way um, Matt Chandler said it one time where he said um, happiness or mm, I think he said happiness. Happiness can never be found in the future. Hmm. So what he said was if you keep telling yourself, well, I'll be satisfied when I or um or actually, I was listening to an episode of Dak Shepard's podcast uh, today when I was coming home from lunch, and uh, it was the John Gottman episode, and uh, he was saying that, uh, Dax was, that a lot of guys were in AA would say, you know, when their kid was born, they would get sober. Um, oh, yeah. Like, that would be the ultimate motivating factor. But what they would then discover is it in- it just introduces so much more stress that it actually does the opposite. It makes it tougher to stay sober. And so, you know, Chandler was saying, you know, happiness or, or, or whatever uh, contentment can never be found in the future by making a, you know, measure or a metric that it's going to be found when something else happens. It has to be decided in the present. Mm -hmm. So you've got to make changes in the present to, to have that stuff found. And, and the example in the movie was, you know, Emily kind of being so fixated on the relationship while ignoring what was going on inside of her. Mm -hmm. Um, 
versus, you know, if she were to, which, you know, movie, fictional plot, some things the characters don't know and we know, and that's just how movies are. But, you know, if she were to have acknowledged the trauma of, I don't know, being murdered and becoming undead, I guess. Pretty traumatic. Um, <laughs> then then she might have been able to move on a little sooner. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for anybody out there who maybe has hurts or who maybe has hangups or maybe has habits that they uh, are having trouble um, dealing with, um, the answer is not if something happens in the future, then I'll. The yeah. answer is uh, to seek hope and help and healing in the present. Um, and it may involve some hard work, but that's where the change will happen is through that hard work in the present. Yeah. And I think too, you mentioned in there that like she was focused on the relationship. I would say, I don't think she was focused on the relationship. She was focused on the marriage because yeah. she really didn't like, that's something you guys pointed out. It was like at the end, she finally awoke to the fact that this other person had like needs and was a person. Yeah. And I feel like that's, I mean, in a similar point, like, you, if you're relying on someone to be a fix for you for a problem or for what, and, and also I know that's not, I don't know if that's ever a conscious, like intentional thing. You know, this person's going to be in my life to fix this problem about mm -hmm. me, but it is definitely an emotional and kind of like instinctual thing. Um, then you're also not really like, you're not valuing that person yeah, you're using them. as a human. Yeah. Like you're, and so that's something to think about too. Wow. That's all. <laughs> Well, Mrs. Treese, those were some great thoughts. Thanks. Um, I thought them up myself. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, yeah. Are you sure that I'm not allowed to say congratulations to you on the show? Ugh. I got a promotion, you guys. Everybody's very excited. She is totally minimizing right there, but I, I want to take the opportunity to say to everyone who's listening that my wife is incredible and is such a big deal. Not even three years ago, she started at her job and this past week was promoted to be the director. Associate director. Well, but that's that's <laughs> a tier that they're co you're in charge of your department. My team, yeah. Yeah, and I just want to say congratulations. I, I am so infinitely proud of you. And just had the most belief and faith and knew that it was going to happen because you're just so good at what you do. Thanks. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you're you. You're the best. Um, I think that's it. That's all yeah. we got for this week. So um, thanks, everybody, for listening. If you haven't subscribed already and you made it all the way through this episode, you win a free subscription. All you got to do is hit that subscribe button and you get it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are you about to offer these people? <laughs> um, so with that, I guess we will raise the lights, lower the curtain, because for this week, the theater is closed. <laughs>